This is the Danger Close Podcast. Beyond the Books with me, Jack Carr. Welcome to the Danger Close Podcast, an Ironclad original presented by Navy Federal Credit Union. My guest today is Mark Polymeropoulos. And if I pronounce that incorrectly, then I know I'm not the first one to do so. Mark is a 26-year veteran of the Central Intelligence Agency. He started there as an analyst and then moved over to the Directorate of Operations, went to the farm, became a case officer, and served in both Iraq and Afghanistan and numerous other postings around the world. We had a great conversation, really enjoyed talking to him, and can't wait to share a bourbon with him one of these days in the not-too-distant future. So sit back and enjoy my conversation with Mark Polymeropoulos. Before we got connected on an email, I already had this. I already had this book. I already knew about you. I was already like, I need to see if he has time to come on in 2022. Love to love to talk to him for a little bit about all this. But uh, so first, by way of uh, introductions, how do you pronounce your last name? And I was, I listened to it a few times, but other people, I'm like, I got it. I got it. I got it. Nope. Don't got it. Polymeropolis. Polymeropolis. I love it. I love it. Obviously a Greek background. That's right. And uh, so, so were you born overseas or were you born yeah. here? So I was, I was born in Greece. Um, my dad was, uh, was Greek, you know, got, went to, but came to the United States on a Fulbright scholarship. My, my mom, who's a, you know, so my dad is this Greek Orthodox. He comes to, it comes to, and he goes, he's getting his, uh, his doctorate um, at Cornell University, meets my mom, a nice Jewish girl from Long Island, you know, crazy Perfect. mix of, 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 of people. Um, and then he goes back in his, and when he's 32 years old to do his enlisted Greek conscription in the Greek army and wow. drag my mom with him, uh, you know, probably my grandparents on Long Island were freaking out. Um, and, uh, and so I was born in Athens and then they came back afterwards where my dad, you know, got it. Uh, yeah, he had a, he became a professor. You know, I grew up in uh, New Brunswick, New Jersey. Okay. What did they have him doing in the uh, in the army once he and he already had a this degree and all this at the time? I mean, he's twice the age of everybody there, you know. And yeah. so you know, I don't know. I mean, he said, I, and it, like the Greek military at that time, we're talking, you know, nineteen sixty nine. Um, you know, not the most professional. Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, I think he was probably just you know shining his boots and and not doing much. And um, but yeah, <laughs> but he said it was pretty miserable. He hated it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, polishing <laughs> your boots, making your bed, doing those corners. I totally understand where he's coming from. That. Stuff drove me absolutely old, yeah. insane. <laughs> oh, crazy. So then you followed in uh, in their footsteps and you went to, to Cornell as well? Yeah, I did. So did, I explained Did you already know about the CIA though at the time? Did you already know the path you were well, on or no, were you so, searching? You know, I grew up in New Brunswick, um, New Jersey. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, my dad was a college professor, but we went back every summer to, to Greece. So I kind of had this kind of idea that I wanted to do something, you know, with foreign policy, the world, this and that. Um, you know, I was, I was looking to go to one of the service academies. I was just, you know, I, I just, I wasn't sure what I want to do, but my, both my parents went to Cornell. So I ended up going to Cornell, but there, you know, there was a, there at the Cornell, you know, there's a career center and the CIA shows up. Yeah. And so I go there to talk to them and, and I walk in there and there's this guy with an earpiece, a security guy. Cause there's protests on campus. <laughs> Cause they're there. <laughs> recruiting. <laughs> um, but you know, I, I, you know, uh, applied and, and I was accepted. It took me 18 months to get my security clearance because they freaked out that, you know, with all the overseas stuff, they're not great about that. Um, and then, uh, and then, so I was, I was, you know, 1993, I walked in the door, January 93, walked in the door only a couple of days, actually, I think after the, uh, uh, or, or after the attack at CIA headquarters, if you remember, oh, wow. um, Ramsey I do. Uh, killed a couple of CIA officers. And, uh, and so I walk in and, uh, it's the only job I ever had. Like I, I, so it's a good thing. I wrote a book and I talked some leadership stuff. So I think I, yeah. I learned a thing or two, but I'm not qualified to do anything else. It was the, it was the <laughs> espionage. I mean, I still do some, some, you know, tradecraft training for kind of your old tribe, um, uh, in JSOC, but, but, but ultimately, uh, only job I ever had was the agency pretty wild. Nice. So you walk in and do you initially go to the farm or do you do something else as an analyst first? Or how does that, what's that journey like? So, so I, so I, I was, was hired as an analyst. I had my undergraduate and my master's degree on, on, on kind of Islamic movements in, in North Africa. And mm. I spent the first year or two um, as an analyst. My first account was what? It was Afghanistan in 1993. Wow. There was about three of us. Nobody cared. You wow. know, the Soviets uh, had, there was the Soviet withdrawal. Afghanistan was a failed state. I saw the rise of the Taliban. Um, uh, which, which, you know, interestingly enough, all the players that I later, let, you know, later kind of came to, to know when I served in Afghanistan. And then even now with the, the current kind of Taliban government, all the same from back then. 
Um, but after about two years as an analyst, I wanted to become you know, a case officer, an operations officer. So, so you know, I, I went to my old boss at the time. It's, you know, in, in, and he's controversial in his own right. But his name was John Brennan. He was just okay. a, brand, a group chief uh, at the CIA. And I said, look, I don't think I want to be an analyst. I want to go overseas. I want to be a case officer. And he said, yeah, go ahead. And of course, probably meant I was a really crappy analyst because they, they never kind of asked me to stay. <laughs> um, but, but to his credit, you know, he did, he did just, you know, didn't say, you know, leave the organization. So then I went to the farm, um, and, you know, for all the tradecraft training and, and, you know, then spent, you know, the next, what, 20, you know, four or 23 years, um, uh, on the operational side, did a ton of time, you know, almost three years in, in kind of conflict zones, Iraq and Afghanistan, the rest of the time in the Middle East, never served in any of the garden spots in Europe to my family's great, you know, <laughs> regret. Um, but really just this, you know, incredible career. And as, I, as I tell people, and it's very similar, you know, between the intelligence community and the special operations world, you know, we had this, we had this view of history, especially after 9-11. So, you know, you're in places um, and you kind of have to, every once in a while you pinch yourself because you're either there, either witnessing history or helping make history. Uh, but it sure, it sure wasn't, wasn't boring. Gee, so they never sent you to Greece. Even, and did you speak uh, Greek? What, you, what did, did you speak going into the agency? So, you know, so I learned Arabic at the agency, but, but I did speak Greek, but you know what, the, the, I, I actually did this on purpose. And uh, because I didn't, you know, because if we go serve in a country, if something goes wrong, you can get tossed out. You can get declared persona non grata. You can never go back. But Greece to me was a special place, the Greek islands. I mean, that's my the place, you know, a magical place where I grew up, you know, wow. I'd go for two months spear gunning with my dad and, and just wow. it was a wild place driving around and you know, trucks and Jeeps and just, you know, it was no rules, nothing. It was crazy. And I, I don't want to lose that. So I actually yeah. never served there, um, which I think is, is, is a good thing. Probably uh, smart. And, yeah. And, and, you know, when I, I, I still, we still try to go back as much as possible now, because I want my kids to understand kind of where their roots are from too. Gosh, I haven't been to Greece in so long, but I want to uh, get back there soon as well over the next couple of years anyway. But, uh, but you, so your, your, your study of Afghanistan really didn't, uh, didn't start in college though. There was a spark with, uh, which Mitch, Michener's book with caravans. Yeah. And what, what year did you read that? Cause I have not read it. Oh. And, uh, and I was read, and I, I was reading this and I was like, right. Oh, wait a second. I got to go read this thing. And I cannot believe that over the last 20 years, uh, well, 30 years that, uh, I have not read that book at some point, nor has anyone recommended it to me along the sure. way. So, so I'm going to read that shortly. You got it. You know, it's, 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 you know, so this is what, again, as I kind of look back, I read it in high school. Or maybe it was, in, maybe it was in, even in middle school, but it, but James Mitchell wrote these books about just different exotic locales, um, and and one of them was Afghanistan. It was <coughs> excuse me, it was about post war Afghanistan, you know, after World War II, and a young foreign service officer who you know really goes to this place, which at that time was was safe, but totally wild, you know, tribal, um, but but also still you know it was a land of hippies, you know, it, yeah. was, it was no extreme you know ex ex Islamic fundamentalism, extremism, terrorism. It was just this kind of you know, place far off, but he writes about, you know, interactions with the tribes in this, in this far off land. Um, and I, and I was totally mesmerized by this and it had an effect on me. And I remember, and I clearly remember this was in, when I first went to Afghanistan in February slash March, 2002. So not on one of the first teams, but early. And, uh, and, you know, myself and a special forces team were dropped uh, in, uh, in Helmand province. We're trying to go after a, a Taliban, probably, a, you know, a, a Taliban target. And I remember sitting across from this, these tribal elders, these Afghan tribal elders, and I literally thought back to the book that I read, you know, decades earlier. And I was like, I cannot believe I'm here. Now, the difference is these people wanted to kill us. Right. <laughs> so right. It's different, but yep. it's still pretty, pretty wild. And, uh, and, and, you know, just what, what an amazing kind of journey that I went through from reading that book as a kid to then, uh, then being on the ground. And then I went back to Afghanistan again for a year between 2011 and 2012 in Eastern Afghanistan. And, and, you know, it's, it's something we all, as you know, worked on just kind of forever. Yeah. No, it's, and it was, it's a beautiful place. Uh, if you take out the, uh, the bombs and the assassinations and Man, executions. And, oh, yeah, right. yeah, exactly. Yeah. But, uh, but I remember hearing parent, like my parents' generation, when they would leave college and maybe backpack around Europe, I remember some of my friend, my parents' friends had gone to Kabul, gone to Afghanistan as part of right. like their, you know, post-college backpack through Europe, find yourself type of a thing. Um, and I remember them, it was late sixties then, you know, late sixties, early seventies. And it was a, you know, a garden spot, exotic location. And they were probably inspired by Mitchner's book as well sure. to, uh, to, to make that journey. You know, there's, I mean, boy, we could talk about Afghanistan forever. Um, uh, because I think for a lot of us, you know, you know, particularly the withdrawal was pretty painful because of just abandoning, um, you know, our allies. And, and, and as I talk about, you know, so 
I have no resentment towards the Afghan people. It's, it's actually it's to the opposite, where if you're in the intelligence community or special operations, you know, we I lived for a year. There was 20 of us. I lived with a thousand indigenous personnel. Um, we lived and ate with them all the time. There was, you know, you know, uh, you know, we knew we had no, um, you know, green on blue incidents. You know, it was it was complete trust. I wouldn't be. We we went on patrol. They saved our lives all the time. There was 20 of us, a thousand of them. Mm-hmm. And so when I think about you know how we left them, that kind of breaks my heart. And I think a lot of people kind of share that. But you don't, you know, if, if you don't live in that in that situation where you're actually not on a U.S. military base. You're in some remote location with with Afghan Afghan allies, and then you know you get to know what the kind of the culture and the people were like, and certainly different than us. But but that that stuff really haunts me about about the withdrawal, and I'm sure that a lot of your you know readers and listeners feel the same way. Oh yeah, no, it's uh yeah, certainly certainly they do as I do. Um, and, and quickly, will you give a rundown on what you what your position was in the agency and the history of the agency? Because sure. in reading this, like there's a couple paragraphs in here, I'm like, ah, oh, he sums it up perfectly there. Yeah. Little, uh, history from World War II changes after World War II, jet bird teams in in World War II, and then uh, and then your position in uh, in the agency and kind of how that that evolved over over time. Because you do a great job of, of explaining it here to set the tone for how you got these leadership lessons in the book. So in terms of my career or just the agency? As the a history, whole? agency history. Oh, so people sure. are like, wait, what's he talking about? Oh, Analyst, yeah, yeah. No. director of operations. No, no. Right, right. So, so you know, first of all, the agency is kind of, a, a, you know, it was created in 1947, but the precursor was the office, the OSS, the Office of, of Strategic Services. And so so ultimately it was a paramilitary arm of the U.S. government, but then the CIA was, was created to obviously be the lead intelligence organization in the U.S. government. Um, the agency is broken up. It's interesting. It's broken up into, into you know, different, what we call, um, directorates. And, and I think one of the things I run, really wanted to point out, and particularly in the leadership principles is, you know, I was a director of operations. So I was a case officer. So that is tip of the spear stuff. But you got to be a little humble because you're important, but you're actually not more important than everybody else. And so the other, the other directorates, when I say the director of support, you know, our logistics personnel and our docs, our medics, stuff like that, you know, uh, you know I mean, bases don't get built, supplies don't get uh, 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 you know, get moved in. There's no money for operations if you don't have great support people. So you have your support staff. Um, uh, you have your director of analysis. That's your your analyst. So you know what? I can do all that great stuff in collecting intelligence overseas. They got to present it to the policymaker. Um, they do so, you know, writing you know papers, briefings, and you know they're the they're the kind of the the link to uh, you know whether it's Capitol Hill with congressmen, senators, or the you know executive branch with with the National Security Council, with the Department of State, Department of Defense. Analysts are critical in providing that information for our policymakers to make smart choices. Um, there's our science and technology folks. You know, these are the ones who do the you know satellites and spy gadgets. Um, and so, you know, you put this all together, and it's really important because it is this ballet. And while you know, in the in you know, especially in you know, in, in fiction, of course, or you know, in books, you know, the you know the the intelligent you know the case officer you know perhaps um, is is the one kind of saving the world. In reality, it's everybody. And, and when you lead a team, um, you, you actually, you, and you, you really recognize and understand that and you have to celebrate everyone there. And I learned that the hard way of kind of being a jerk, thinking <laughs> I was such a badass. But then later on, when you actually in charge of a lot of people and you're like, hey, I got my, you know, the door kickers here, but you know what, I need money and resources like, and the legit, and you know, from your military career, logistics, nothing gets done without all this. And so, you know, you kind of really got to celebrate every everyone, every member of the team. And that's why, you know, I always tell people CIA is a really interesting place to work because there's so many different things to do. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We have some, uh, some analyst stuff into this next novel in the blood that comes out in May. So I get some of that side of the agency in there as well from my, from my, from my brief glimpse from when I, uh, I worked there in 2006, sure. just as still in the military, but just working there. Um, and between then, between when you joined being the analyst, going to the farm, now you're in the director of operations. What do you do up until 9-11? What's that life like for a, for a case officer? So, you know, everything did change on 9-11 for everybody, as you know, because, you know, we shifted so much to a counterterrorism focus. And then I spent, you know, the majority of the rest of my career um, doing CT work until the end where I did more on, on Russia. But, uh, uh, you know, but but your your regular job as a case officer where you're, you know, where you're, you know, posted either you know overseas at, out of a U.S. government facility um, you know, the agency with all their kind of craziness, as you know, about pre-publication stuff. I'm like, you can't say it's an embassy, but of course it's an embassy. <laughs> um, I think you went through some of that stuff and getting your books cleared. Too, I did. Right? Yep. I did. Um, so, but ultimately your job as an operations officer is to, is, you have a couple kind of key tasks. Um, one is, 
primarily you're supposed to recruit new new agents, new assets. And and, and let me make a, a good point for for everyone, your readers. I know you know this. That a CI, there's CI officers. An agent is a foreigner who we recruit. Um, there are no CI agents who are who look like me. Uh, uh, you know, in terms of uh, uh, in, you know, actually U.S. government employees. But ultimately. You know, we're looking for people who have access to, to privileged information, non-public information. Um, so you're looking at, you know, Iranian nuclear scientists or Chinese military officers or Russian intelligence officers, um, Pakistani military officers. But, you know, we are trying to penetrate those governments to gain information that help our policymakers uh, make the correct decisions. So my job is to find individuals however I can, and then you assess their vulnerabilities. And that's really the most interesting part of kind of intelligence work, at least it, it was for me, is because it's really, it's a human, um, uh, it's a human aspect of it because I'm looking at that you have access to information we need. Well, now do you have something that where you're vulnerable? What kind of motivations do you have? Maybe ideologically you're not attuned or you're not in tune with your own home country. You believe in the United States and our principles of, of you know, economic and, and, and political freedom. Um, maybe you have money issues. Uh, maybe you want your kid to go to, you know, Yale uh, or, or just or, or whatever. So so ultimately, I'm looking for something that's going to get get a hook into someone to, to have them commit espionage and provide information to the United States government. And it's actually, you know, I, I mean, being an intelligence officer in the United States is not it, it's, a, it's a really good thing because it's America. You mm -hmm. know, you don't have to sell America. America, regardless of anything that's happening now in our political sphere, is still seen by the rest of the world as a land of political and economic freedom. You know, one of the things that I lived overseas in the third world, so I appreciate this country, warts and all, because the 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 you know uh, you know the other side of things uh, ain't so pretty, um, yeah. and and so so ultimately, but that's what I did. So I was I was running agents and recruiting agents, um, uh, and then of course working with foreign governments at all. We call it liaison. So we would have a relationship with another country's intelligence service where we kind of work together behind the scenes, and 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 that was done against traditional targets. So again, as I said before, Russians, Chinese. You know, Iranians, North Koreans, and then 9/11 happens, and our and our focus certainly shifts to to counterterrorism. Yeah, and so in those pre 9/11 years, uh, were you ever involved with a uh, like a handoff of of an agent? Like, what is that like if you if you yeah. develop this trust with someone in one of these uh, these foreign nations, and then you're there for one year, two year, three years, whatever it might be, and then you have to go. Maybe you leave the agency, you retire, whatever it is, but you have to do a handoff with somebody new. Right. Like how dicey is that? I'm sure every situation is a little bit different, but now this person who has put their trust in you all of a sudden has the new guy to figure out and develop that trust with them. And that just seems like a, uh, uh, like a tough one to, uh, to hand off, especially when you're dealing with life and death situations. Now, Jack, that's a, that's a great question. And that's actually what I was not really good at. So I was, I was a very good recruiter. Um, you know, I have this outgoing personality. I'm Greek, which means when I was serving in the Middle East, you know, they kind of identified, you know, with us. Mm. I, I literally, I, I was in one Middle Eastern country one time, and I remember uh, someone actually said, well, you know, I know you work at the U.S. Embassy, but you can't be a spy because you're actually Greek. And I'm like, that's what you want to think. That works for me. <laughs> um, but but ultimately, what, what when I would recruit an, an asset, mm -hmm. a lot of times it would end up being based on the personal ties that I had developed with them. And when it came to do what we call turnover and really institutionalize a relationship, because guess what? You know, th they're not spying for me. They're spying for, you know, Uncle Sam. I actually had trouble with that sometimes because the, the and and even if this this agent was giving us great stuff, he'd be like, nah, I'm not, I'm not, no, nah, I'm not going to do that hand. I'm not going to do that turnover. I, I, right. Why don't you just stay? And I'd be like, well, because I got to go home. <laughs> I've been here for three. Right. Years. Yeah. Um, and so I actually always had trouble with that. And so what I learned kind of later on is, is is when you develop these relationships in the developmental stage, and when you actually formally recruit someone. You got to make sure it's done, you know, you know, you know, through that, that this is a relationship with the CIA that that individual is having, but also kind of kind of start weaving in, you know, early on that, OK, you know, I'm not going to be here the whole time. Right. Um, it's just our system is such that we turn over our, our agents. And there's a reason for that, because you want it to be institutionalized. But mm. you got to remember, and the most most incredible part about being an operations officer to me was that kind of it's almost like a psych 501 class. This individual, by the way, has put their life in my hands. Right. And so that is an incredible amount of responsibility I have. Well, from that person's standpoint, well, okay, well, I got to break someone else in because I trust Mark, mm -hmm. but am I going to trust, you know, Suzanne or John or, or right. Jessica or whoever it is coming next? Mm -hmm. I don't know. And so that, that's hard. And, and you got to, you got to look at it from their perspective, because again, um, you know, the, uh, uh, especially when you go after some of these really harder targets, you know, the, the price for failure is, is not good. Right. Um, and, and I, you know, I tell a story in the book one time, 
about an agent I was training and, and he looked at me and, you know, and, and, you know, and we were, we're actually in Europe. I was training him on a communication system. He was going back into his home country in, in, in the Middle East. Um, but he said to me, he said, you know, look, and he, he got, he was unbelievable. He goes, he goes, I get this, but let me just tell you something. You know, I know that, you know, we're going to meet probably once a month in our very careful surveillance detection routes and our, in our trade craft and the techniques we use to, to meet clandestinely a, an agent on the streets of a denied area. He said, but, and so you're, he says, Mark, I know you're going to think of me maybe, you know, uh, you know, a couple of times a month. He goes, but I'm going to think about you every single day, because if you make one mistake, I'm going to die. And my whole family, my whole tribe's going to die. So just, you never forget that. And I was blown away by that. I mean, you know, cause that's a hell of a lot of responsibility. And I know, you know, I know what you did in your past. Jack, and there was a hell of a lot of responsibility. And, and so it's, it, you know, it's, it's kind of one of those times where you sit back, you're like, you know what, I can't mess up because if I do this, is, you know, I, I have this person's life in my hands. And, and that makes you really, you know, that makes you work harder. That makes you want to be better. Um, and, and certainly, uh, you know, uh, take, uh, take this job very seriously. Yeah. Jeez. And having that, that having done that study in, uh, uh, of, of Afghanistan, knowing the players, um, kind of, getting there you know, after the, the Soviets withdrew, but uh, having an understanding of the culture already, uh, the players already. Um, when, when 9-11 happened, wh- where were you on 9-11? And then did you init- sure. right away know, I know what this is, I know exactly what this tie is, or how did that uh, take sure. shape for you? Oh boy, what, what, a, what a, a great question. So actually, and I got to be careful on how I say this, um, I, was, I was posted in the New York area. Got it. Uh, on 9-11. Um, in fact, we were not there that day. We were in Greece on vacation, but my daughter's daycare center was in World Trade Center five. So I would have been dropping her off at that time. Um, I came back right away. Uh, actually, I, 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 you know, I, I kind of, you know, we were stuck in Greece. There's no flights back. I remember with my young children going to the front of the line, the first one of the first flights out of Europe, out of, out of Athens, the airport was packed. And I, and I told my, my, my kids, I said, act sick. And so we walked up there. It wouldn't work now with COVID. No, no. We walked up there and, and I was like, I have a sick child. I have to get back. And they actually let us get on the plane. So I made it back home. And then from there, um, you know, I was, I was, I was actually, uh, uh, you know, seconded to the, uh, what's called the Joint Terrorism Task Force um, out of the uh, FBI field office in New York City because I spoke Arabic. And, uh, and so, you know, off we went. And I, I remember, you know, only days after 9-11, we were walking through the, the rubble. Um, and, uh, you know, it just, and, and, you know, these things always, always stayed with me because, you know, in, in, you know, there was a tremendous loss of life of, of, of course, of Americans, but also of both, you know, New York city fire department and police, uh, uh, police, the police department as well. But I remember seeing there was, um, a New York city policeman playing a bagpipe. There, there, I mean, this is, this is only the, the place is still, it's still burning. It's smoldering. Mm-hmm. And, he, and it was the middle of the night and we were doing something. That I think we were trying to recover some, uh, you know, uh, trying to recover obviously personnel, but also, you know, documents and things like that. And, uh, and, and you're hearing this, this individual playing the bagpipe just kind of blew me away. Um, and, and look, I, I remember some of, you know, I, I, I was lucky enough to run a CIA paramilitary base years later in Afghanistan, um, 10 years after the anniversary of nine 11 and the param- the, the indigenous personnel, the Afghans still had some baseball hats that one of my predecessors had all given the team, which were New York NYPD hats. And so just, you know, really emotional times, um, for being in New York city during that, during that time period. Yeah. So interesting. So you got to hop on a flight fairly soon after 9-11 yeah. and have a, a transatlantic flight, meaning you had time to, to think a little bit, um, for a lot of us, you know, it was just, it was go, go, go. Uh, I was already deployed. And so we knew we were, we figured we were going to Afghanistan. We ended up going to Kuwait instead and do some shipboarding stuff on Iraq and the oil embargo thing. But, um, but you had time to reflect for a second on that flight. And a lot of people didn't have that. Right. time because they're, they were in it, especially if you're military or in, in intelligence services. Right. Um, so what are you thinking on that flight? Are you thinking sure. about, are you thinking about Al Qaeda? Are you thinking about bin Laden? Are you thinking about uh, how he's a guest of the Taliban? Are you thinking about U S response uh, possibilities, what those could be like, what right. is that flight like for you when you have time, those hours in the air to reflect? So I'll tell you what I was thinking. And this is, this is reflective of a lot of, of, of CIA personnel. Um, I, I was thinking we, we failed uh, that, you know, and, and, and we failed in an almost impossible task. I mean, it's almost asking, you know, I mean, I don't know what kind of sports analogy or soccer goalie, you know, we let one pass. Well, it's hard, um, but, but we failed. And, and I think, it, it, but, but based on that failure, you know, you were actually, you're, you're driven. And this is a terrible, not, not a terrible thing to say because it's not a professional thing to say, but you're driven for revenge. Uh, you know, we're, we're supposed to not have that feeling in, in our line of work. You know, you don't do things to get revenge on people. 
but you kind of do. <laughs> <laughs> hey, well, it's a very human, na- uh, it's, it's part yeah. of human nature. Um, you know, and so, so, but ultimately is that, you know, we wanted, we, we knew who it was immediately. There was no doubt. Um, you know, I mean, when they ran the manifest, you know, the, the flight mm-hmm. manifest, they, they, they saw right away, but, but ultimately is that, you know, we failed, and even though CIA was warning, you know, in president, presidential mm-hmm. daily briefs, um, you know, even though there was a kind of a robust effort on collection on, on certainly on, uh, on Osama bin Laden, you know, we failed. And so, you know, now it's, you know, the, the famous line is, you know, today's September 12th. And that, that was kind of our line every day for years. Right. Um, and, uh, and, and so, but it was, it was a feeling of, uh, of that we let one go, um, and a feeling that, you know, responsibility. So what do you do then, uh, a attached to the joint terrorism task force? Or what do you do during those, the time before you go to Afghanistan? Cause you get there right. to Afghanistan in, in 2003 ish or what? When yeah, you... I got there in, in February, March Oh two. So, okay. So when I was, oh, so that's it, pretty quick. It was quick. And I actually, I left, I left New York fairly soon after that to go to a Middle Eastern post to get kind of closer to to the fight. And and this is very similar probably to your old line of work. Everyone's begging to go. Like I oh, feel yeah. you know, our headquarters personnel, you know, I, I was on, everyone's on the phone with that. You know, they they, you know, it's just like get me on the next plane out there. And, and in fact, you couldn't. I mean, they had to do this right and organize teams mm-hmm. correctly. Um, uh, but but you know, you have to remember that in the days after 9-11, there was a, a total complete fear that there was another attack coming. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, and, and so, and especially, so, you know, if I'm, if I'm, you know, you know, working with the FBI in New York city, are there, are there cells in New York, you know, you know, are there sleeper cells or the other things that, and kind of piecing together the, the logistics network that, um, you know, Al Qaeda had used. And so, but there was, there was just, you know, incredible fear of this and, you know, this, we're going to go down a road. I probably don't want to go, but you think about, you know, some of the things the U S government did with enhanced interrogation techniques and all the, the things that we did afterwards. Um, everything was based on that fear that, that not if, but, but when there was another attack coming and we had to stop that because we missed the first one. And so, you know, so ultimately it was, uh, it was just work and overdrive to make sure that that didn't happen. We didn't know if there's sleeper cells in Queens or the Bronx, um, mm-hmm. or Brooklyn. I mean, you know, you know, and so, so you just had to run down, uh, every lead. And then, uh, and then of course, ultimately, you know, the, 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 fo- a lot of the focus did shift, um, you know, out to South Asia. Right. And did you, uh, when you land there then in 2000, March, 2002 okay. and get to Afghanistan, what are you, what are you doing right away? Cause it's still wild West out there. There's like, oh, yeah. yeah, there are some processes in place, but we're still figuring it out. Uh, and we, I mean, obviously we never quite figured it out, but at least process wise, you're still, uh, playing with, on a, on a board that, uh, that we don't have that much oh, on the sure. ground experience with yet. So what are you, what are you doing in those, in those early months on the ground in Afghanistan? So, so, you know, in, in, I remember I'd say, <laughs> this is. You know, one of the great things about CIA is that we, you know, we show up when asked, we volunteer all the time. Um, I do remember that when I, the first night I was in, 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 in Afghanistan in Kandahar, um, uh, and, you know, there's just a couple of us, and this is February, February, March, end of February, 02. And they said, Hey, Mark, you have guard duty tonight. I'm like, all right. You know, and, and so, and, and, and I was, I was not a member of CIA's, you know, paramilitary branch, um, uh, you know, ground branch or air branch or, or maritime branch. Those are that, that's that's kind of the special operations capability of the agency. But I was a um, I was a CIA uh, a case officer who spoke Arabic. So and and you know we all gotten kind of rudimentary you know you know uh, military training. So and and particularly before Afghanistan and Iraq, we went through kind of our you know obviously you know uh, uh, training on M4 and Glock and stuff to keep us mm-hmm. safe. But we're certainly not in, in, you know a, a of an offensive ca- capability. Nonetheless, here you are in a war zone. So I'm sitting on the roof. And, and I jump up there and, um, it was, a it was, a uh, you know, one of your former, former tribe, it was, it was a seal who said, Hey, take this AT4. If anyone comes across the, you know, across that wall, I'll shoot this thing. And I'm looking at him like, and he, and he leaves. <laughs> and I'm like, he goes, I'll see him in four hours. I was like, hold on a second. <laughs> How do you use this thing? Luckily there are directions thing, on the I'm, side. I'm I think literally like praying like for the next four hours and like, just, I, I, someone's I, and like, and we have, there's only a couple of us. They're sleeping. I mean, you know, we're, we're just rolling nonstop. So when someone finally came up, I'm like, hey, can we kind of go and show me the damn thing? <laughs> yeah. and, and, and they're like, it's pretty damn easy. I'm like, all right, but like, give me 10 minutes. So, yeah. so I love these stories because it's it's also kind of the expeditionary feeling that we had is like, all right, we'll make it work. I mean, you know, I, I've arrived in places later on when I went to Iraq, but I lived with the Kurds up in northern Iraq. We got there. Logistics fell apart. We had no weapons. So then the Kurds are giving us their weapons. We're not supposed to do that, but you just do it. Yeah. And so, you know, um, but but uh, the... Uh, you know, my, the, the, the kind of the first foray into Afghanistan was really interesting to me because it was it was so new. Um, and uh, and it was also at a time, too, where 
I mean, we, you know, this was not supposed to last 20 years. Um, so, you know, we were hunting down Al Qaeda. I remember I was debriefing a lot of Al Qaeda prisoners. One of the things that I, that I was, I, I will never forget. And this also, you know, I think the American people don't understand this is, is, you know, looking an Al Qaeda member and the Taliban were pretty nasty too, but there's a difference between, you know, the, the Al Qaeda guys were rolling up early. Yeah. You know, this person, if you plunk them, you know, down the street here in, in Northern Virginia, it would probably, you know, gut every American they saw. Mm-hmm. These are these are evil individuals, and 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 I and I and, and you know I say that you know, I don't say that lightly, um, but you know the, as as you know, good thing that I you know that that they were kind of you know you know cuffed and 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 bound because you know they see an American they will want to kill them. I wouldn't say that for every Taliban member. I yeah. and, I, and I, look, I, 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 I spent a year fighting the Taliban. Al Qaeda is a different story, and so I think Americans kind of forget that. Um, yep. that these individuals were kind of dedicated to killing any American they could um, worldwide. And, and that's a, that's a, that's a, that's that you don't really, you don't really face that evil. And I, and I, I don't want to sound kind of, you know, no, I get it. Hyperbole, but you know, oh, yeah. and, and so, and so at the end of the day, you know, in my view on this, and it's a little extreme is, you know, we, we you know, either you capture them or you kill them. Um, there's, there's, you know, there's no peace deal with Al Qaeda. Mm-hmm. Right. So, yeah, I know. I remember those looks in the eyes. And then I remember thinking about the Taliban and, you know, what they were doing before 9-11, uh, especially you know, the different tribes, different warlords, who was right. on whose side, why shifting allegiances, the history um, uh, of Afghanistan, of the Soviet experience in particular, uh, of what happened in the next decade after the Soviets left, um, you know, all of that. But you're, yeah, I, I distinctly remember, especially in those early days, <laughs> before we radicalized, probably a lot of Taliban, <laughs> maybe turned them <laughs> closer to what Al-Qaeda was earlier on. Um, I remember those looks in the eyes as well in those early days. And just and, was, you know, look, yeah. You know, when I got to Afghanistan in 2011 for a year, like, you know, uh, you know, I mean, the Taliban killed some of my friends. And so I and, and we killed a lot of them as well. And so they were definitely our adversary. But again, ideologically, it wasn't the idea that every American on the planet must die. That is what Al Qaeda believes. Yeah. Um, and so so that to me was my takeaway from kind of my first foray in there. Um, and uh, and you know, I'll just I'll never forget that. Yeah. And then how long are you there or how long are you, you're there, maybe back before you start to shift focus on, uh, towards Iraq? What is that? What is that transition like? Well, and, and, you know, it, it, it's funny you ask that question because, you know, perhaps that is, you know, and, and I, look, let me just preface this. I'm deeply proud of my service in Iraq. I was there for half a year after this. Um, but perhaps we shouldn't have been because I probably should have stayed <laughs> in Afghanistan. So ultimately I, I came back. And uh, and Iraq was kicking off. So so only months after I returned from Afghanistan did I find myself living in the in the mountains with the Kurds in December of 2002. Wow. Um, it's un, you know it's but and th- these shifts now are kind of normal the way. Right. Are, but but thinking back, you know, you kind of you know, and, the, and the effort that we made doing that, you know, I kind of wondered maybe that was not the the smartest use of our resources. Oh yeah. Uh, but it's you know it's, it's it's debatable. But so I was so again it was on another small team. Um, it was it was a joint agency kind of uh, uh, U.S. Special Forces team um, up living in the Kurds before the war, uh, you know, in you know December of two, um, and and as we were kind of you know it, it, we weren't positive that everything was going to kick off, it was pretty likely, and so we're running agents to in essence you know collect order of battle um, on the Iraqi military, and uh, and we're we, I mean we are so deep inside Iraqi territory that our our exfil plan was literally to walk into Iran. Yeah. Um, and we all laughed at that. Like, like we could, the, you know, the, our U.S. forces in, in Israel couldn't reach us, not with, the, not with what we needed to get out of there. And so wild time again. Um, uh, and uh, and so then, then you kind of shift focus unbelievably only months later to to Iraq. I know there's so much to un- unpack on that one, but uh, <laughs> but tactically, many times my E and E plan was also to run to a, lo- uh, a border, no matter how many kilometers away it was. Uh, especially after reading Chris Ryan's you know SAS account back you know in the '90s, I thought, all right, you know, instead of like sitting here with fishing lures, right. you know, from a little That's kit, right. I'm going to yeah. be on my getaway sticks. I'm going to be running. Uh, so I, so I totally understand that. And, uh, I think we can say the name of the team, but I won't say it just in case we can't, that was up in, uh, in, nor- uh, kind of Northern Iraq area that, that filtered down, that was made up of some, uh, indigenous types. Cause I, I worked right. with them later, but, uh, that was, uh, that was they awesome. Were amazing. Uh, I, yeah. and, you know, I, the, the Kurds were fantastic. And, and, you know, so, so, I mean, I, I, we probably could have a, a five hour conversation with all of our kind of shared experiences, but, but again, later on, kind of my belief, you know, uh, uh, and, and it's this is not even politics. It's just that, you know, with, with the U.S. pullout where, there, you know, when we kind of uh, we're going to going to leave the uh, the Syrian Kurds, um, uh, you know, uh, I, I had that same kind of feeling. So I, so I remember 
just, you know, you know, my kind of my affinity for the Kurdish people. And, and it's really interesting because they're very proud. They're fierce warriors. The Peshmerga are a bunch yeah. of bad guys. Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, up there, Missoula and kind of north in that area. It's beautiful up there, depending on the time of year, I think. Yeah. But uh, gosh, what a beautiful spot. There's a couple of places that reminded me of like Northern California wine country in the spring up there. It was like beautiful snow melting, things turning green. Like it's different than people's, than people's just vision of Iraq, you know, which is like some d- destroyed buildings there, oh, kind of dusty and, you know, no, that sort of thing. I, and, and, I, and, I'll, and in great, and you'll appreciate this having worked with us over the years in great CIA fashion as we arrive up there. Uh, myself and one other case officer, you know, you know, uh, uh, the, the, I think our first order of or business after kind of introductions to our, to the Kurds is we certainly uh, got them to give us uh, Amstel beer. Nice. <laughs> so, uh, you know, if they, if the one thing about, and, and the, you know, it was great working with your old units over the years, but, you know, there's nothing like a CIA base because, you know, you're going to have good food and beer. Anywhere. Oh yes, I'm well aware. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I had such a great time working with you guys. Uh, it was a highlight of my time in uniform, and it was such a natural fit too, um, oh, totally. just because of the, uh, the the approval chain for what we were doing specifically at the time in 2006, uh, the way we planned, and it was just um, it was awesome. I had such a great time. It actually formed the basis of my second book, True Believer, is based on that experience. Um, that, that, you know, and and you know, so there's a couple things to unpack on that, and I'll tell you a really funny story. Um, but but ultimately, as we look to the future, and, and I've written about this before, and I had a great chat with Chris Costa, who's the executive mm-hmm. director of the Spy Museum, and you know former uh, you know uh, uh, you know uh, U.S. military special operations veteran. But ultimately, you know the 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 twenty years that CIA and 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 we can say SOC, but it's really JSOC to be honest, or SOCOM or whatever, um, uh, you know, have worked together. Uh, you know, there's more to do even after that because the personal relationships that we yeah. have built. And so. You know, we got really good at manhunting together, but you know what, when we, when you talk about great power competition in China and, and Russia, we can do the same thing. Like we still need to know what, what, you know, Russian GRU officers are doing mm-hmm. uh, or Chinese MSS officers. And so when I finally left my, you know, my position, when I finally retired, I remember having discussions with, you know, uh, with, uh, with, with, you know, senior, um, uh, you know, the SOCOM folks about like, Hey, let's transition smartly because we had built all this. Yeah. And, but the biggest thing is the personal relationships. Oh yeah. That became um, apparent okay, very early back. on. Yeah. I got it back. So this is, this is the story I was, I want to, I was thinking, I got to tell you the story. I got to tell Jack the story today. So I got, I got pulled out of Northern Iraq um, and sent to a, 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 a kind of a secret base in the middle East. Um, and I got link, linked up with dev group mm-hmm. um, to go in with, to, for the high value target hunt into, into, into Baghdad. Um, really two incredible months where we kind of ran these, all the HVT operations kind of going after the deck of 55, those, those cards. But when we, when we got to our base and I'm, I'm sitting there and we're, you know, there's sandstorms, it's miserable. And in typical CI fashion, I was like, this ain't going to work sitting here eating MRAs. So I call thousands of, well, maybe not thousands, but a couple hundred miles away to, the, to that mm-hmm. country's U S embassy. And it, within a couple of days, a giant truck arrived with huge platters of food. Nice. And so, so the, the seals there were like, those guys are okay. There you go. You're building those relationships. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. You'll have great relationships with those guys for forever. So yeah, that's, forever, that's fantastic. Um, oh. But it was, that was a pretty, pretty amazing time. And, uh, and we did some great work kind of rounding up the high value yeah. targets. And, you know, I was the one who had, you know, I had, I had a network of agents. Um, obviously the, you know, the, the teams were the, you know, kicking down doors. Um, but really seamless cooperation and and again relationships that that were formed there kind of last a lifetime. Yeah. So pretty amazing. Yeah. And it's interesting to look back through a uh, strategic lens uh, now with the documents that are coming out through Freedom of Information Act requests, and more of those will come out, you know, over the next 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. But uh, just to see that shift and uh, go back and question, not to lay blame um, and not even for accountability, because we're not really very good at that at our senior levels, but to learn the lessons and apply them going forward as wisdom for future generations. So it's like when you see that uh, Tommy Franks gets uh, summoned to uh, to Crawford, Texas in December of 2002, uh, while CIA guys and um, guys, special operations, military types are in the mountains of uh, Tora Bora. Um, and those guys are requesting more troops. They're requesting Rangers. They're requesting Marines. They're right. requesting 10th, 10th Mountain to cut off escape routes and flood that area. Maybe the next 20 years is different. But at that same time, they're talking about Iraq. And yep. President Bush, Bush is asking Tommy Franks, hey, can you fight both in Afghanistan and in Iraq? And, of course, he gets the yes, sir. Sure can. And uh, so I, I, I think that's going to be a pivotal time. No, no, I, I agree. So, so I think there's, a, you know, there is there. I look at this in two ways. One is our individual service. And, and frankly, you know, you and I have no vote. 
when we're asked to do something. And so you go and you do it and you do it to the best of your ability and you're proud of what you did there. Um, uh, but if you, if you kind of step back and, you know, especially in retirement, you know, you know, uh, you know, the, the move to Iraq, there's no doubt in my mind, you know, was, it was a huge distraction. Yeah. Um, it, it just has to be, it is, it is, you know, not only for resources, personnel, but also for attention from the white house. Um, and, and, you know, it's, a you know, it, you can make an argument that in both kind of both arenas, uh, uh you know, we, we did not succeed, uh, nearly as we could have, or I, I, I hate to call them failures. I, I gotta say that, that and maybe that's just cause I was there. Yeah. Um, and I, and I'm proud of my service there. And, 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 you know, when it comes to, to Iraq as well, I mean, I think there was, you know, huge mistakes made. I was there on the ground um, when the decision was made for kind of debathification, uh, you know, dismantling the Iraqi military, stuff that we were on the ground. You know, it was it was I the intelligence community and SOF were advising against that. Mm-hmm. But kind of some ideologues was, you know, wanted to kind of purify Iraq. And that just it was a massive mistake. Yeah, it's about uh, understanding the nature of the conflict in which you're engaged and putting that requisite time, energy, and effort into that. And yeah, right. depathification and disbanding the military. Terrible. Uh, yeah, once we're already, we already made a bad, we already made an error, and now we've now compounded that error, right. created an insurgency that we're going to deal with uh, for the next number of years. Um, tough, tough to do. And when you look at it now, because I remember over time how our target packages shifted, how uh, our con ops and uh, those things had to shift a little bit uh, as they went up the chain for approval, uh, where they had to go, depending on the target, depending on the threat, like all those all those things that uh, as a big bureaucracy kind of got even bigger. Um, but, you know, I also remember being very aware of being used against somebody else because of some centuries old feud um, because someone killed someone's great grandfather's goat and all the rest of it, or just being used to kill an, a rival tribe or a warlord or whatever else. And uh, how we kind of fell for that uh, a few times early in the beginning, but over time, Hey, how important it became to have disassociated human. So human intelligence networks, uh, and then corroborated by some sort of technical means just to make sure you're going after the right person for the right reasons. And you weren't going to make a bad situation already worse first, do right. no harm. Um, so I remember how all that shifted. So when you look at that, especially as we got near the end, when we really had to have all our ducks in a row before we went out and hit a target, um, on, on the intelligence side of the house anyway. Um, when you look at the intelligence that, uh, we had strategic level, to justify going into Iraq. What do you think about that now? And you look at, look at that, because it seems like it's almost less than I had to have in 2011 as we're getting ready to go, to go hit a target. Right. Oh, well, I mean, I I remember sitting around uh, with the Kurds uh, watching Colin Powell's UN speech. Um, Now the Kurds were excited. They could, they could Mm. care less what he was saying. (laughs) Uh, You know, it was, it was, it was us, you know, CI personnel and 10th group personnel looking at each other thinking, Where's this from? Mm. What are they talking about? You know, we're in Iraq. Um, now, I can make a very strong case on human rights. Uh, mm. you, know, the, the, you know, the Iraqi regime, you know, Saddam Hussein was an evil human being. And, and in fact, you know, some of the things I did later on, I remember going to, uh, um, uh, to Ramadi um, early on before it got nasty. And, you know, we're digging up mass graves. You know, and, and, and so there's a lot of really bad stuff that, right. that, that Saddam Hussein did, but the whole Iraq WMD thing, I remember watching that presentation and we were like, hope there's another stream of intelligence somewhere because we've never heard this. Right. And, and, you know, it was a little unsettling because, you know, I think, you know, ultimately you can make a, you could have made a different case for overthrowing Saddam. Yeah. Um, but, but the intelligence, this was a massive intelligence failure. It wasn't, it was, a, it was a, an intelligence failure. It was really an analytic failure on, on the part of the intelligence community. Um, Cause I can't say it's an intelligence failure because there weren't any agents that actually <laughs> were part right. of it. Other than the famous, you know, curveball, which wasn't even ours. Yeah. Um, but also single source you know, intel. The, the uh, you know the the uh, the analysis was you know was was seriously flawed, and I, and I think the CIA. I hope they did. I mean, that, you know, that, you know, really, there was a lot of reforms after this. Um, but that is something that that we will never le- live down, nor should we. Yeah. Um, you know, it, frankly, and so you know, yeah, again, talking about things that I talked about in my book, humility. You know that, that that you know I love George Tennant, but that comment you know about about it being a slam dunk will 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 live in infamy. It, that certainly will. And uh, I mean, you're this is awesome. You had such a t- I mean, you had both the pre September 11th time, kind of like I did. I had one platoon before, and then everything else is post September 11th. And you're in a very similar situation, so you get to see the ag- agency kind of shift in its priorities and focus. Get very good at man hunting. Get very wor- good at working with the military um, right. to to hit these targets and, and develop the intel and develop the the uh, the assets that that are needed to go and do these things. Um, but uh, uh, what 
you're in the mountains of, of, uh, of Afghanistan, you're in the mountains of, of Iraq. Um, and then in the book, you talk about how you, you lose, actually lose an agent or someone that you're yeah. involved with, you lose, you lose somebody. Can you just talk a little bit about that? And I think it's around the search for, uh, for Saddam, if I'm not mistaken. So, so this was, it actually was before that. I mean, everything was a search for Saddam for sure, but yeah. this was, this was actually before the war kicked off. We were running someone and he was collecting order of a battle. It was an Iraqi military um, or, or, you know, police or security official. Um, and, and we pushed him. I pushed him. I was his case officer. I pushed him too hard. And, and, you know, despite the agent saying I'm fine, you know, there's a thirst for information back home. And so, you know, we, we frankly just met him too often. Um, and he got caught and he got tortured and killed. And, and that had a really kind of profound effect on me. That was the first time it ever happened. Um, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't deep into my agency career at all. And, you know, you don't forget people's, you know, faces uh, uh, of individuals who, you know, you know, we didn't have, a, I didn't have a, a close relationship like others that, that we had recruited because these are, these are war zones. These are battlefield recruitments. This is someone who wants to bring down the regime. We made contact, we vetted him enough. He's providing us order of battle. So, so, you know, you know, we think he's pretty good. Um, still have to be skeptical, but, but he got caught. Um, and, and, you know, I, and I never forgot that because, um, because, because ultimately, you know, I, it's, it's under my control, how much we meet him, the meeting cycle, and we pushed him too hard. And, and I talk about that in the, in the book, in one of the leadership principles, you know, um, on adversity, I call it adversity is the performance enhancing drug to success. So, so that was rock bottom. You, you know, that, that is not a good feeling when you're mm -hmm. handling someone who gets caught, but I, but I, I contrast that to years later. So I was, then I was a base chief in Afghanistan for a year in, in Eastern Afghanistan in Pektika province. 2011 to 2012, and, and our sole job there was to hunt down Taliban. And and one of the one of the individuals kind of on our target deck was uh, a, a Taliban member who had killed two CIA officers several years earlier. So there was plenty of motivation. Um, but I but I approached this a little bit differently and a lot more patience. Um, and that's kind of the lesson in this is that uh, you know I I'd been humbled before, um, but I I just did everything right in this. Well, I didn't do it. My team did everything right, but just with some with, with a little bit of oversight for me. Where we recruited the right agents on the ground, you know, we vetted them, made sure that that we could put this, you know, obviously we, you know, this uh, this Taliban member on the X, and 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 I will say is once he was no longer with us, um, <laughs> it's a good uh, you mm -hmm. know a sterile term. One of the one of the one of the proudest things of my career was um, members of my team who knew the CIA officers who had been killed. You know, we we and this is not you know no cable traffic, certainly no permission for this, but we grabbed a sat phone. And called back um, to our officer's widow in Fort Bragg, uh, and told her that we had avenged her her husband's you know her, her husband's death. And I'm telling you, sitting around that night around the fire pit, you know, we always called the fire pit in Afghanistan Caveman TV, yeah. um, you know, and and we might have had some uh, some some whiskey or bourbon. Um, that was a damn good feeling. Um, and and I remember after doing that, after accomplishing that you know that task that operation, I was like. Like only thing left is get all my, all my guys and gals home. Cause, cause we did it right. Amazing, amazing moment, you know, not didn't change anything. Um, but this, these, these, the Taliban member who was taken off the battlefield was still trying to kill us forces. So we certainly helped on that, but, but the idea that we don't forget our fallen, um, uh, that was, that was pretty special to me. And, and amazingly enough, I'm telling you the story, the agency cleared this whole story. Maybe because it's a great story, it's a real story. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but you know, when I when I when I kind of wrote these these stories, the operational stories in the book, they they were you know some of the things they do is straight. Like I can't say JSOC, whatever reason I'm not allowed to say that I work with JSOC, but I can say SOCOM. Does that make any sense to you? I have no idea. But but these stories they cleared, and so I'm really I, and I'm happy they did because it also you know th these things are really meaningful for me. So I'm happy to always kind of kind of pass that on. Yeah, that review process is pretty interesting. Uh, second book, they took out fifty four. They had fifty four redactions, whether it was a word, a sentence, a passage, whatever it might be. Uh, and I appealed it, and I won on thirty seven of the fifty four uh, because I had my lawyers tie all fifty four to publicly available government documents, right. not like another person's book or a Wikipedia page or a New York Times article, but a publicly available government document. Um, and even though all 54 were tied, they only let me win on 37. So when the paperback came out, those people can look and see, compare the, the hardcover to the paperback. And then uh, I did the same thing on the third one, but I think they saw what I was doing on that first one and didn't want people comparing what I was going to win on because I was going to win. We tied them all again in the third book to publicly available government documents. Uh, so they said they weren't going to let me appeal. So I took that as like, hey, stop bugging us with this fiction stuff, kid. Go get, you know, let us do, let's do the important stuff, like, you know, like things like this. Well, I mean, you know, I think that that ultimately, uh, 
they're the I, I so I sympathize with the the, the staff there because there's so much they have to do. Yeah. Um. Uh. It's just the met. It's just they're just they're inconsistent sometimes. And so if you take that time to point this out, and there's there's times where I've put stuff in for review, um, knowing that I had gotten it cleared maybe a couple of years earlier, but just to be nice, and they deny it, and I'm like, okay, then I got to go find the thing in the past, and I point that out, and then they clear it. You know, the, the, you know, we do have a secrecy agreement, um, and we have to, you know, obviously adhere to that. I mean, what you know, I would, you know, the the it's interesting because there's so much out there about the, the intelligence special mm-hmm. operations world. So, you know, I talk about tradecraft. I talk about running surveillance detection route. Mm-hmm. Every intelligence service on the planet does the same thing. Mm-hmm. So it's really not that sensitive. But if they want me to take out a couple of things, that's fine. Right. I'll, that's, that's okay. Yeah, I did some research on that for my for my latest book as well, particularly the surveillance detection routes and right. with another service because I was very curious okay. about what uh, what a foreign service does. Uh, they all that do as well. the same thing. <laughs> That's what <Yeah>. I learned. <laughs> That's what I learned, and I use it in the in the book as right. as well. Um, but you have some great things in here, and you talk about a, a mentor who you call Charlie uh, oh, yeah. in the book. Can you talk about him and and where you sure. met him and what he uh, what he meant to you? So so Charlie Seidel was probably the greatest Arabist in the history of the CIA, meaning he was an expert on the Arab world. He was. Um, his dad was a CIA officer. He, 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 he went to high school in Tehran in Iran. Wow. Amazing enough. Um, spoke beautiful Arabic, then spent his entire career in the Middle East, never spent a day at CIA headquarters. So he is a legend for that. You wow. can't do that anymore. Yeah. Um, but that is like, you know, that that's the gold standard to never kind of go back home and kiss the ring. Um, but Charlie, Charlie really taught me about, about the importance of being a mentor. Mm. Um, he, unfortunately, he passed, you know, he, he left government service, passed away. He, he, he tragically had a heart attack. Um, a, a couple of years ago, but, but, you know, some of the, the, you know, he taught me about mentorship and about caring for your officers. And, um, I, you know, I'll just, I'll, I'll just never forget all the things he did. And, you know, I, I, I tell a story in the book when I came back from Iraq after six months, I was not in good shape. I had some pretty nasty PTSD. I was having awful nightmares. It was just, it was, you know, I couldn't sleep. I was dead bodies. I mean, you know, as you know, you're there, I mean, you know, I was there, you know, in Baghdad as we took the city. And so there's, there's death everywhere. You know, I saw people killed constantly. And, and while I never pulled the trigger myself, I certainly collected intelligence and gave it to a, you know, a Bradley fighting vehicle crew who then just opened up on, on a house. Uh, and then I see what happens after that. And so, you know, I, I was, you know, uh, uh, I, I was not in great shape when I came back. Uh, my wife was really worried and Charlie knew about this. I think my wife talked to Charlie. So Charlie then invited the entire original team um, from Baghdad uh, to, his, to his cottage in Cape Cod. Massachusetts um, for two weeks, and that's the original CIA team that went in. Our security personnel. He even invited some of the uh, some military folks, um, some of the FBI, kind of for the FBI HRT was there. So it was kind of this kind of crazy group of folks all together, and uh, and for two weeks with all our families just sat around, and ate lobster, and drank beer, and and I really it, it helped me tremendously. Um, and Charlie just did that for me. Um, he was just this incredible kind of selfless uh, individual, and. You know, there, there's nothing that that, you know, I, I, I there's no one I can think of what kind of a more profound effect, not only myself, but probably the entire Middle Eastern, um, you know, all, all the personnel from the CIA's uh, uh, operational director, you know, responsible for the Middle East was mentored by him. Yeah. And so, you know, I, you, you got to point stuff out like that because he just was selfless. He cared about people. Um, and that story about, you know, my time in Iraq was just unbelievable. Yeah, no, incredible. A mentor like that is, uh, uh, you know, creates that next generation, and then you do the same to someone else coming up, and yep. you know, paying well, that, you know, paying you, that well, forward. You learn things. I mean, I'm certainly you did. You learned that in the teams, and and the agency is a little. Sometimes agency can be a little bit of a nastier place in terms. You do work alone a lot, mm-hmm. so a CI case officer goes off uh, by themselves quite a bit. So. Uh, you know, you know it, it, when you're lucky to serve on a team in a war zone, you know, you have that feeling. It's, I think it's what you had all the time. But Charlie then kind of pushed forth the notion that it's not about yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it really is about those, you know, to the left and right of you. And, and uh, the other thing is he always had this incredible smile on his, on his face. I mean, I, I talked in the book about my screwing up an operation somewhere. This is actually a funny story that I was, I was, I was uh, tasked to recruit a, a hard target individual from, from an Arab country. Um, uh, and, and what happened this, this, this uh, this uh, intelligence officer, I almost said who it was. Geez, this uh, this intelligence officer from a from a different country um, ended up in a, in a hospital somewhere, and we were supposed to make an approach. We knew he was kind of interested in talking to us from some other collection, and so you know, I, I we kind of screwed up. I went in there with a local police official, and we kind of way too aggressively almost broke down the door to confront him. And with him in that room are a whole bunch of his own country's security personnel watching over him, his minders. And we, so this whole thing is blown, compromised. 
the, the local cop slowly took out a card and said, we were just here to make sure you're okay, that everything's okay with you. Total bullshit. Yeah. Kind of talked our way out of it, get back there. But, and, you know, so the story is funny, but, but I was mortified and I'd have to write a cable saying like what an idiot I was that, that <laughs> kind of busted it. Did no kind of surveillance before to see if anyone was in the room. Mm. But Charlie sat me down and first he's smiling. He's like, cause he knew I screwed up. He's like, did anybody die? I said, no. He said, uh, 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 did you embarrass the United States government? I said, no, we got out of this. He said, did you lose any money? All the things that CI really doesn't like happening. Yeah. <laughs> so I said, no, we didn't lose any money. He's like, it's going to be all right. Nice. And so, you know, again, yeah, that's just, that was his kind of, you know, in perspective. You this, well, you have a threshold as a leader, you know, for the things that matter. And so, yeah, mm-hmm. so I love talking about him and, uh, you know, miss him dearly, but yeah. you know, one day we got to get a movie made out, made, made about him. That's my goal. There you go. There you go. Sounds like a fant- fantastic guy and would make an incredible, incredible movie. Uh, now in the middle of all this, we have the Arab spring that, uh, that right. sweeps an area that you've been intimately involved with both studying and then on the ground boots, boots on the ground experience. Um, when that starts to, starts to move, I guess, where are you, what are you doing and what are your thoughts on it now and how we reacted sure. to the, uh, to the Arab spring and that change, changing the landscape of the middle East. Right. So, so I was, you know, I went back to Afghanistan 11 to 12 and then after, and, and I got, and I, then I got really sucked up into the kind of the, 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 our, our fight against Al Qaeda. So interestingly enough, I, w- I served a lot of time in the, in the, in the Arab world right before the Arab spring actually mm-hmm. kicked off. Um, you know, the famous start in Tunisia and then kind of the, the uprisings in Syria, uh, obviously, you know, Mubarak uh, in, uh, uh, mm-hmm. in, uh, in, uh, in Egypt. Um, so, but, but uh, uh, as, as we kind of saw, as I saw this kind of sweep the Middle East, so I, I, I was really focused at that point, and I'll, I'll tell you why, I'm going after Al Qaeda. And that's because, and I've told this publicly, and it's, it's you know, I, I can only say just a little bit, but I was you know, involved in the, in the, the tragic uh, uh, operation in coast Afghanistan on December 30th, 2009. Um, and frankly, you know, partly responsible for some of the screw ups there. Um, and so, you know, if really for, for probably five, six years after that, I shifted away from traditional Middle East tours just to working in our counterterrorism center and trying to, you know, uh, you know, go after as many Al Qaeda members as possible. Um, uh, and, and so, so, that's a, probably a separate story, but but in terms of the Arab Spring itself, there, there are a couple of things on that. One is, you know, it was, it's what's interesting is that that CIA did not do a great job on predicting this. Um, again, it's having that humility. We weren't great on that. It, it, it really did take a lot of people by surprise. Um, but what is most interesting uh, uh, on this is, um, you know, just from a, from a personal perspective, having lived there, is that you know there was always this idea that that kind of you know the Arab world you know didn't care about democracy. And that Arabs themselves kind of love these strong, you know, strong men as leaders. But it turns out that actually that's not the case. Now, they're not great at democracy because a lot of the Arab Spring failed. Um, but, but ultimately, I, I remember actually sitting, look, I, I had, how can I say this? I had worked with the Egyptians over the years. So, you know, the, the U.S. government had a very close relationship with the Egyptian security services. And I also remember watching Mubarak fall, um, uh, you know, not feeling all that terrible because mm-hmm. there was this feeling that, you know, there was some, uh, some, a future ahead. Now the Egyptians then squandered it, you know, uh, you know, in essence, then, you know, a, 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 a kind of pro Muslim brotherhood government right. comes in and now they're back to having the Sisi, a strong man in charge. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but, but, but in, in reality, during those, during really the, the key portions of the Arab spring, I was just all in on CT stuff. Yeah. Um, I spent a lot of time in Yemen um, uh, and so, you know, whether, and, and a lot of time going, you know, working against Al Qaeda and the Arabian, AQAP, the Al Qaeda yeah. and the Arabian Peninsula, which turned into a really deadly terrorist group, um, mm-hmm. that, that, uh, that, it, you know, tried to kill many Americans as well. So, uh, you know, it, again, it's, it's just, it seeks counterterrorism always sucked me back in. Yeah. Um, and not a surprise. I mean, that's just the, the nature that the, that, the, you know, that the, what the world was. Yeah. And what, uh, so what lessons personally and professionally did you take from co- coast then? Did you, oh, uh, right. yeah. Right. So that was awful um, in so many different ways. You know, first of all, you know, an officer under my command, you know, Darren Labonte, who was a friend, he was killed. Um, uh, and and having to stand up and kind of tell all of his colleagues. Um, and I was in an oversight role at a, at a station. But, you know, tell him that, that Darren was gone was, was awful. Uh, the worst moment of my life. Um, also, some feelings that, again, it, you, know, for, you know, this is, this is the, 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 the downside of being on the tip of the spear. Um, just that, just as you know, we felt a sense of failure after, after nine 11, huge sense of failure after the events in coast, we got beat. Um, so, so ultimately, you know, Al Qaeda ran a double agent operation at us and they beat us at it. And so, 
you know, looking back and all the mistakes that we made, that was very difficult. And then, you know, and it still is. Um, uh, but ultimately it goes back again to that sense of humility, because I think that a lot of us didn't think that a terrorist group could be able to run not a sophisticated, but an effective counterintelligence operation mm -hmm. against us. And they did. Uh, and, and the signs were there. We missed a lot of them. Um, you know, you know, coming down to, you know, at, at the, at, you know, at the, at the very kind of bare bones is that a lot of officers who actually made some decisions that, you know, one could kind of question, you know, aren't here now. Um, you know, why, why the, why the double agent was met in the way that, that he was not being searched and things like that, which I don't like talking about it all that much because, because mistakes that were made, these people, it cost them their lives. Um, but those of us who had oversight of this made some terrible mistakes too. And, you know, it's something we always have to have to live with. So, you know, I look, I look at my career, um, and there were some incredible high points. You know, I, I was very lucky to, you know, to, 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 you know, receive a lot of, you know, you know, fancy decorations. And if you, you're welcome to come to Northern Virginia anytime. We can have a bourbon. You can look at all the bullshit I have in my uh, in my Perfect. basement. All the metals. But you know what? That does. I mean, there was a lot of really bad times too. Yeah. Um, and you know, I had you know, I, you know, both agents and then officers. I was responsible uh, for you know who were killed. And so um, that was that was a very difficult time. It still was. I, I definitely went on kind of a. I've been criticized for saying this in, in public too. You know, not on a revenge spree, but I worked counterterrorism for many years after that after and we tried to kill as many al-qaeda members as possible um I'm, I'm actually quite fine talking and saying oh, yeah that. yeah i mean um, you weren't the only one in that boat so yeah uh, uh these are friends um and so you know so ultimately uh, uh that was that was a very difficult time i think really humility is the, is the biggest um you know biggest lesson from that and yeah. uh and and you know there and there was you know there was certainly a review process and i think there, these there are lessons learned that people still kind of follow today um, which is the right thing. You have to have an actual after action on, on when a tragedy occurs and you have to, um, you know, certainly kind of own up to it. And, and I, I remember when I was promoted to the senior intelligence service, which is like the general officer rank in the mm. military, sitting in our bubble with my family thinking, I do not deserve to be here after what happened back then. Um, so, you know, people can, you know, I, you know, you know, obviously my, my, my former colleagues are the biggest judges of, of our, our, you know, of, of our failures in that operation and they're not wrong. Um, but I remember it talking to our accountability review board um, when this was going on. And I, and I said to them, I said, whatever you all judge, you know, we can get disciplined, fired. You know, it can be anything. There's nothing that you're going to do that's going to make me feel any worse that I feel. Um, so it's not me getting exonerated. It's not me getting punished. Um, ultimately, there was a decision, I think, uh, uh, that um, and there were a lot of people involved in this operation. And a lot of people like myself deserve blame. But there was a, a decision by the agency leadership that to kind of leave it alone, that um, and you know, whether that's right or wrong is debatable, but I, it wouldn't have mattered one way or the other to me because I, 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 I to this day really still, that, that haunts me. That was not, that was a terrible time. And, and, and just, you know, I, I mean, I still communicate with, you know, Darren's family. Um, I, you know, I still just talked to his dad, uh, uh, you know, who's a former seal in fact. Um, and, and, you know, uh, they, you know, whether they have kind of forgiven or not, that's, that's totally up to them, but they know that they're always part of the agency family. And I think we've really tried to take care of them. Yeah. Oh, so tough. And so you were out of the, of the business for a couple of years, maybe it's two when the Afghanistan withdrawal happens this last August, is that about, yeah. about right time wise? Yeah. So are you spending, let's say from January of 2021, are you seeing March? Are you seeing June moving into July? Are you seeing the writing on the wall? Are you studying this or, yeah. um, and, and so, so what are you seeing, uh, in this, uh, in these, few months before August of 2021, um, when we actually pick up and leave and, sure. and you see us, uh, you know, leave Bagram and are you like, do, do you have questions about that? And you're, you're seeing oh, this through the, right. through the lens of being back out of the agency right. now and looking at it holistically, if obviously with a bedrock of a foundation from sure. which to, you know, an, analyze, but, uh, but what are you feeling? What are you seeing in those months leading up to withdrawal? And what are you, what are you thinking about? So, so, you know, what a great question. And, and, you know, I think that the, the and I'm not I'm not kind of shirking you know responsibility on when I say what I'm going to say is that I blame both the Trump and the Biden administrations um, for what occurred. You know, I thought the Doha agreement was massively flawed. I had, I you know, I I, I have friends who are still inside and both you know in, in state, the military, and the agency. Um, uh, there was a clear desire to just leave, and so the Doha agreement was a was a surrender agreement in my view. Um, and the implementation of that was a disaster under the next administration, under the Biden administration. Um, so the whole thing, in my view, was it was a kind of a complete goat rope. You know, I was always a, a, I, I always would, and based on my background, like I never, you know, I, 
in essence, I mean, there was there was very few troops on the ground, um, even as we're negotiating with the Taliban, you know, kind of the end. Um, I always thought that we should leave, you know, a, a small force of, of both special operations and intelligence personnel. Um, uh, you know, so so, you know, whatever agreement was reached, I think that was that was one that I that, that I thought would have been smarter. But frankly, both, you know, former President Trump and President Biden wanted out. And, you know, and they were elected by the American people each separately. And so I think people were just tired. And so, you know, ultimately the implementation in the end was, you know, was was handled so poorly. Um, uh, it was it was awful to see. But but I thought I think I think, you know, we saw the writing on the wall um, when they, we started you know, with with kind of the ratification of the Doha agreement. Um, you, said, you know, it, the things were things were going to go south. And, and, you know, as you see, you know, those involved with, you know, the digital Dunkirk and all, all the event, you know, all the, these you know, incredible folks who've been, who are really instrumental in trying to get Afghans out. They were howling about this for years. You know, the, the idea of, okay, if we're going to withdraw, what do we do about the, and it's not 10,000, the, the hundred plus thousand who are in serious, you know, it's you know, going to be in serious distress. Um, so it just, the whole thing was, was, it was like an awful kind of car wreck you're watching in slow motion. It really and was. Then, and then, you know, when, when everything happened, I mean, you know, I guess, I guess, you know, the one thing I'm proud of is I, I think I went on, you know, Fox, CNN, and MSNBC across the ideological spectrum to kind of give my views on this. Um, and so it's it's not it's not it it, it, does, it ends up not being political. It, it ends up just being that you know uh, you know I don't think we uh, that we we handle this in a very smart fashion. Um, uh, you know, and, and, and you know, there's not. It, it, I, I I almost equate this now. There's an argument now in the press. You know, what do we do about Russia Ukraine? It's not a binary choice between a nuclear war with the Russians. And total capitulation, just like with Afghanistan, it's not a binary choice between, you know, there was, I mean, there's only 8,000 troops there remaining hmm. um, versus zero. I mean, I think, you know, there's there's nuances in this that I think that that we could have that we could have done better. And so, hmm. I, I, look, I, I believe in the, the concept because of my, you know, look, I joined the CIA, you know, you, you were in the special operations community, like our job is to, what do you call it, defend forward. You know, we are supposed to be like, we always deploy. I'm okay with staying in locations, you know, for, for long periods of time, even for years upon years with small numbers of forces. Cause that's, you know, I joined the CIA to do that. Mm -hmm. um, that does not mean there has to be 15, 20, a hundred thousand U S troops. Can it be small groups of, of, you know, intelligence community and SOF? You know, I, I think that, I think that, that, that to me is the answer in a lot of these places. And, and that's not universally accepted. Um, but I think that, that, you know, that, that can be an answer where, uh, where you don't have to have this binary choice of all or nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Gosh, in those months leading up, you know, seeing province after province fall, just seeing that writing on the wall and right. uh, seeing us give up, give up one of our uh, most uh, tactically advantageous positions to put our forces in a strategic or a tactically disadvantageous position. I mean, leaving, leaving Bagram was, was, was a disaster. <sighs> um, you know, and, and especially if you kind of look towards, you know, to, you know, the future great power competition with China, like having, having held on to Bagram Air Base would have been um, uh, you know, you, you can think of being important, you know, and, and let me let me just make one kind of statement about our Afghan allies, because a lot of people are very upset that they kind of folded on mass. Well, there's a couple of things. One is the Afghans who were trained by the intelligence community and SAF fought. And people have to be very clear on that. There's a difference between regular Afghan army and those, you know, uh, you know, uh, commandos or NDS personnel and all the different iterations, what we're calling them. Um, but the Afghans trained by U.S. special operations, the intelligence community did fight to the end. Um, but number two, it doesn't help. If you, and again, I know the history of Afghanistan. Afghans switch sides all the time. That's what they do. Yes. Um, and, and so when, you know, the U.S. administration uh, and everybody's guilty of this starts, in essence, gaslighting the Afghans, they just jump ship because that's just the way it's always been for hundreds of years there. And so. You know, um, I, I remember I remember uh, talking to a, an, an Afghan agent we had, and I said, "I said, give me give me your journey over the last twenty five years." Well, well, he was a communist under the old <laughs> old you know when the Soviets were there. Then when you know uh, with Soviet that was under that was that was under the Najibullah regime. Uh, but then when the, you know the Muj were kind of going to win, he switched sides to the Mujahideen. The Taliban came into power in ninety four. He became a Taliban member. Then with the U.S. invasion, he flipped sides to us, and I was like. What's going to happen when we leave? And he looked at me. He's like, eh, yeah. that's what the Afghans do. So when we start gaslighting the Afghan military and, and government to tell them they're kind of pieces of crap, um, yes, they all fled. And that is very dishonorable, but certainly didn't help. Um, uh, I thought it, I think it proved to, to be an accelerant.
I mean, we had 20 years to look at our own experience. Like you just went back to 78, 79, 80 right there. Uh, like you didn't even have to go back that far. I mean, you didn't even have to go back to the three British incursions in the 1800s and early 1900s. You didn't have to go back to Alexander the Great. You didn't have to go back to any of that stuff right. to figure this out, which just drives me crazy because if we well, screw exactly. up at the tactical yeah. level, like we're right. going to be held accountable. Strategic level decision makers, yeah, not held accountable. So, so Jack, you know, one of the things, and you know this probably more than I do, is, you know, what is critical in in not warfare, but in, in even insurgencies or counterinsurgencies and working with indigenous groups. Um, and I would say it's, it's hope. If you take hope away, you know, uh, th that's, that's critical. That's a critical element. And the United States, you know, you know, whether we liked it or not, you know, um, you know, you know, provided kind of that, that, that overall supervision on the Afghan military, you take that hope away. Um, you know, it, granted 20 years, they should have been better. Absolutely. Um, no, I mean, we, I mean, we should have been better at understanding that. Yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. Senior level leaders yeah. should have been, should have understood that, right. should have taken a breath and just looked at a little bit of that history. Like you understand, yeah. um, you know, I've, I've done some reading myself and it's quite obvious that this is the case that you switch sides. Why wouldn't you? So if your tribe's going to get slaughtered, your family's going to get beheaded. If you don't switch yeah. over to the more powerful warlord, well, guess what? I'm going to him. Just like in 2001 in December, we had some Afghans on our side, uh, on our side probably because we had some cash that we we gave them in many cases. So of course they're going to come to the strong man side for that point. And then it's just, gosh, it's just it's just crazy. And I think but think about what you said too. We're not having this conversation if we weren't distracted by Iraq. If they're in the yeah. mountains of Tor Bora, tenth right. mountain was left. I mean, all the, all those decisions which turned, which looking back now, because remember we went in there simply to try and, and kill Al Qaeda. Um, you know, and, and then, you know, the, the kind of the, the morph into nation building, obviously, you know, it was an error, but, <laughs> but if, 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 you know, you look back, there's a couple of decisions that probably were made that, um, that really affected the next two decades. Yeah. I think you can go, you're talking about, um, uh, some of the, the forces that, uh, the agency and, uh, special operations trained there in Afghanistan about fighting. And I think there's a video it's probably still on YouTube. I don't know if it's been taken down yet, but I think, and you've probably seen it of, uh, of one of those groups just getting executed. Uh, I think it was in June. I want to say maybe early July. Yeah. I can't remember, but uh, I mean, it's just heartbreaking. Same groups, same groups, by the way, that saved our lives for years yeah. that I lived with for a year. I mean, and, and where I lived in Eastern Afghanistan was, you know, there was this, I have a, I have a, I have a down in my basement, Time Magazine. I, I can say it now. I've said it in public before. It was called Shkin. Mm -hmm. It was Bob Lilly, but Shkin in Eastern yeah. Afghanistan, Time Magazine called it the most dangerous place on the planet. I've been there. So these, you know, you've been there. So, you know, our, our indigenous forces were alive today because of them. Simple as that. So, God, so crazy. There you have it. So now you're on the outside. I mean, hopefully we can take these lessons from Afghanistan and from all these things over the last 20 years and, you know, apply them to what we know from previous history and then apply them going forward, like I said, as wisdom. But uh, so now you're on the outside and you're, you're doing some uh, uh, leadership. You have the book, you're doing some leadership talks, right. you're doing strategic analysis, you go on these different programs, you get asked your opinion on these things. Of course, now we have Ukraine. Um, okay. And, it, you know, I think there's that, so they're not a part of NATO. A lot of people right. think, wait, are they a part of NATO or are they not? Because we treat them kind of like they are, or it seems like. And right. if you're just passively walking by your TV screen with Fox or CNN on it, that might be what you think. Um, right. But there's this Partnership for Peace initiative that they are a part right. of that almost de facto makes them kind of part of NATO. Uh, Clinton and Bush 43 both uh, talked about wanting them to eventually be part right. of NATO, uh, which means there's an Article 5 that if they are attacked, then we have to help, but they are not part of NATO now. So it gets very right. you know, convoluted, especially for the, the voter that is not not uh, taking a breath and taking the time to, to look into these, these sorts of things. Um, so from, from your perspective, um, what's the strategic rationale for making Ukraine essentially a, a U.S. ally? Um, sure. And why is an independent Ukraine vital to U.S. national sure. interests? So, so first and foremost, Ukraine is a democracy. Um, and and you know, that does mean something. Um, you know, we've had we've had a relationship with the Ukrainian government. We certainly had U.S. military and special operations forces there, you know, helping them in their fight, you know, uh, against the Russians who invaded Ukraine. Um, you know, so this this would be a reinvasion or or more of one. Um, but ultimately, you know, the, the you know the post you know NATO and the post Cold War kind of security arrangement um, in Europe, um, you know, is based on this idea of you know nations cannot or should not invade each other. Um, and so you have now an aggressor, Russia, really threatening what is a democratic country that sits in Europe. I mean, Ukraine is essentially Europe, not a member of NATO, um, wants to become a, NATO, a member, you know, probably won't be admitted for a variety of reasons based on kind of corruption and things that, that happen there. 
but but you know and so and so it's 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 murky in terms of our actual you know uh uh you know not contractual but our actual um uh you know uh commitment to intervene on their behalf um like we would like we would do another nato member but what i'll tell you is ukraine is a democracy ukraine is a country we have incredible incredibly tight you know relationships in the intelligence and military sphere and and the way i look at this is that the stuff that you and i used to do over the years so so right now we would be or would would have been for the last several years with training with our ukrainian partners so just like i feel about the afghans the kurds and the syrians you know how do we look our ukrainian partners in the eye and say hey by the way we're not going to be there for you now does that mean 100,000 US forces fighting with Ukrainians absolutely not again it's not binary can we do things like lethal aid can we do things like special operations forces intelligence community covert action cyber elements of hybrid warfare against the russians to help the ukrainians sure that doesn't mean us is going to get involved in the war um but we got to help because that's the word we gave our ukrainian partners as we're helping them build up a democratic state um and really defend them from what is you know the, the russians are you know it's a, it's a, it's an autocratic rogue regime um so ultimately i think there's you know we have an obligation you know morally and ethically to do so because you and i would be there would have been there the last several years um with the ukrainian forces and and are we going to again you know abandon people who we give our word to like what what word does the united states have if we don't support them again does that mean we're having us you know us troops fighting there and and i hate that 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 you know we're not calling for a us war with Russia. US though has to help Ukrainians. Um and if we want to kind of keep that that kind of, you know, that that the tradition of the post cold war order in Europe, um this is this is super important. So to me it's a it's a pretty easy choice to assist them in an incredibly complex and delicate situation. I don't expect the US you know US military to be fighting the Russians in Ukraine, but we should assist, you know, behind the scenes and there's there's plenty that we can do and uh you know, I mean that I think that um uh uh the, one of the things that's the wild card is that you know Vladimir Putin doesn't do anything based on what is in the best interest of Russia. And so if you look back on Russian history, you know, he believes that Ukraine is not a country. Period. Um they want it back. Mm-hmm. Um he also wants to kick the United States out of Europe and really and 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 one of one of the things Vladimir Putin's kind of state of being is to is to diminish and really destroy NATO. Um so we're dealing with an adversary that might not even act rationally at times and what is in the best interests of 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 Russia. So super complicated. You know, I I I will tell you just a, a you know kind of a well if I tell you a secret it's not a secret because all your <laughs> listeners do it. It's just us here. But I I will say I was uh you know as I was as I was talking to uh our current CIA director the other day Bill Burns. I got a chance to see him and I said, you know, I'll 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 come back to government. Send me out there. Um, and of course that's not the case. I'm 52 and kind of broken, but, uh, but ultimately I think that, you know, I, I know, you know, I, I think we, we should really support our Ukrainian partners, do it in the way that we do yeah. behind the scenes, intelligence, special operations. Um, and, uh, and that's just a, kind of the right and ethical thing to do. Yeah. It seems like there's a lot we can do these days that we couldn't have done 30 years ago, 50 years ago, certainly, um, uh, where we may have had to move a piece on the chessboard physically, uh, it seems right. like with, uh, the cyber warfare, um, and some of that sort of sort of thing. We have some some uh, tools in the toolkit that we did not have in years Absolutely. past. So, um, you know, for me, and, and I put my, even when I was on the ground in Iraq and Afghanistan, I would try to think about what I was doing from the enemy's perspective. From back then, it was because for uh, out of a tactical necessity, uh, just red gaming it from, from the enemy's eyes. And then now as an author, you know, I do it in the fictional space, but I put myself in, or try to put myself in Iran's shoes or North Korea's shoes or, uh, sure. or, uh, or Russia's shoes and, and, uh, and think about what they've learned from us over the last 20 years, uh, how they apply that to their, um, to their foundational knowledge of history and past relationships sure. with our country and all that stuff. So, uh, when I think about what's going on now with, uh, with, Ukraine and Russia, and I haven't thought it through um, just because things have been so busy. So I put very little thought into it. Um, but when I when I put myself in in Putin's shoes or in Russia's shoes with their history uh, with uh, the Ukraine, uh, both before from the end of World War One, uh, then shifting at the end of World War Two, um, what that was like, uh, and then what it would be like just proximity wise to have Russian troops in Canada or in Mexico, um, and what that would look like to us. Um, and if they were using our same rhetoric with that reversed. So I try to put myself in, in their sure. shoes. Um, and as I think things true, try to be thoughtful about those things because I saw our leaders, you know, not put that requisite time, energy and effort into things over the last 20 years. Uh, and so, so I try to do that on the outside as a, as an author. Hey, now. Here's, here's something to throw out. And I was thinking this the other day, because clearly the American people are exhausted. 
um, as, as is the CIA, as is SOF, exhausted after 20 years. I mean, one of the things, you know, I still, I, I still have the, you know, the ability to have a lot of access to your old, your old tribe. And, and, you know, I don't think anybody in their right mind wants to see us involved in another war right now. People are tired. Um, and, you know, and, and so there's, there's no doubt about that, but the world is still out there. Mm-hmm. We still have, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, enemies and adversaries and aggressors. And I think that, um, you know, I was, I was, I, I, this is funny. I had a huge argument. My, my dad's 83 years old. We had a wild argument on Ukraine the other day. Um, cause he thinks I'm this crazy warmonger, but I was trying to tell him it's not binary. I actually don't believe we should, um, commit U S forces there, but we should commit U S you know, the, the, kind of the, the quiet elements of, of U S power. Um, but, but, you know, but I, but I think we, we do have to be careful of, of the notion of, of our adversaries see us as tired and they're going to take advantage of that. So I, I do see what happens in Ukraine and how we respond. You know, the Chinese are watching, mm-hmm. you know, vis-a-vis Taiwan. And so, um, you know, we still have Iranian nuclear talks uh, going on. And so, so every move we make there we sh- where we show weakness um, and, and you, can, you can define weakness doesn't mean it doesn't have to be t- defined by military action, but. But, you know, the world still goes on. We still have conflict. And so, so you know, how we react to these crises is really important because our adversaries are watching. Yeah. Um, and just because we had, you know, 20 years of, uh, you know, uh, with, with two wars doesn't mean that, um, you know, the world is at peace and we can kind of turtle up, yeah. uh, you know, back home in the United States. Uh, you know, I, I just don't think that's wise. And I think that our adversaries will take advantage of it. Um, uh, and so, you know, it's, it's going to be it's going to be, a, you know, for you know, whatever you think about this administration. Um, you know, they have a hell of a lot in their plate. You know, if you have the Iran nuclear talks, you have Russia, Ukraine, you have China, you have, you know, you know, the, the Houthis are, 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 are sending, are, are, are hitting the United Arab Emirates mm-hmm. with drones. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a, and, and then you still have the CP issue with Afghanistan. There's a lot going on. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot and, going on. There's always been a lot going on. And, uh, yep. and when you look at China, then North Korea, and you're looking at these hypersonic weapons and you're looking at right. things like passive targeting, which I don't think people really understand or, or talk about how important that is. Uh, and when you're talking about our enemies' capabilities and quantum computing, and when you talk about these three things in conjunction with one another, um, and look at where we're focused kind of as a country right now, what our capabilities may or may not be, but then look at, uh, what China and North Korea and what their capabilities may or may not be. Maybe they want us to see something, uh, when they actually have a more robust capability, uh, out there, perhaps, I don't know. But, um, when you look at those three things, hypersonic weapons, passive targeting and quantum computing together, um, would you say those three things are, 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 are what you, focus on as far as hey, what China and North Korea have in their arsenal that we should be worried about? Well, and, and I, and, and, and throw on top of that, you know, other elements of, of hybrid warfare, um, you know, which, which is what China practices mm-hmm. on us all the time. So, and that, that's also, um, uh, you know, you know, as, as they kind of extend their reach, I mean, you know, the, the Chinese own, you know, half of Africa, you know, they, they own the Greek port of Piraeus. Oh, and right? these are things that I think the American people don't understand is their economic, yeah. um, uh, you know, offensive economic platform is such where, where they are, they're investing in areas where, you know, the, the, the they're, they're helping a country in, in time of need, but in return, they're going to actually own that country. Yeah. I mean, there's a huge controversy, you know, a couple of years ago about, about the Chinese, um, uh, trying to, uh, in essence, buy up the port of Djibouti, mm-hmm. um, huge you know, U.S. military, uh, uh, you know, installation there. Um, but, but you know, when it comes to things like when you, you raise hypersonic weapons, I mean, think about your your previous career in the Navy. You know, what is the greatest platform in the U.S. Navy? It's it's an aircraft carrier. You know, and I'm sure you've been on carriers. I've been lucky to be on, been in on carriers before. There's nothing like seeing like the power mm-hmm. of you know, uh, you know, when I was there watching you know F-14s or F-18s take off. Um, is that are they? Is that irrelevant now with hypersonic weapons? Is is it is an aircraft carrier a platform that in a conflict with China is going to be taken out immediately? I don't know. Um, these are things that people should worry about right now. Yeah. Um, and and so uh, you know so so one of the things that I think there's there is bipartisan agreement that we have to shift towards kind of great power competition against China, mm-hmm. but we always get caught up in something else. So now we're stuck in these other crises. Um, it's incredible because because the Trump administration got it right and the Biden administration got it right, saying we got to shift everything towards China, and but you get sucked up all the time in other mm. other uh, you know regional conflicts, and that's where we are. Once again, we're talking about a, a fighting a land. It's not going to happen, but you know a land war in Europe. In the U.S. I don't think will be be involved, but ultimately, what about China? And you saw the other day. I mean, I, I, what I what I read in the, you know, in the press the other day is there was the biggest incursion of Chinese aircraft um, into into you know Taiwan's airspace. Uh, uh, in, in many years, if not history. And so, 
um, you know, we're, we're again, we're, again, we're, we are missing out on the whole China piece, yeah. uh, but that's the way the world is. Yeah. It certainly gives me a lot to work with in the fictional space as well. Um, oh my God. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you know, when you think about the fictional, I mean, the, the, you know, that uh, you could write a great book on a, on a China, you know, Russia alliance, which is what everyone's great for is. <laughs> oh yeah. So I was, it was crazy. I was thinking about that like way before it actually came into the press. And as soon as I saw people start talking about it, I'm like, dang it, you know, I've just done that in the last book. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, can you talk a little bit about why you retired? Some of those I read in the, in near, sure, near the yeah. end of the book about some of those, those headaches and where they may have come headaches, from. Yeah. And cause we've, people have seen a little bit of that in the press. Um, right. can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So, so at the end of my career, um, uh, I was, I, I was named the deputy operations and then the chief of operations over what's called the Europe and Eurasia mission center. And so essentially I was a head of, I was the head of all clandestine operations across Europe and Eurasia, which includes, um, you know, Russia, you know, uh, and so it was, it was, Interesting that they moved a lot of us who did counterterrorism in the Middle East for a long time to work in essence over Europe and Russia because they, you know, uh, you know, after after obviously the the Russian interference in our elections in 2016, Russia, all the things they were doing towards us, they wanted us to take the same kind of, you know, uh, uh, you know, fight to the Russians as we did for all the years in the Middle East and counterterrorism. And that, obviously, we can't do the same things, but it was the pushback mm -hmm. against the Russians. So they moved a lot of us kind of Middle East and, and counterterrorism hands to do that. And so that was actually. Pretty interesting, um, uh, and but be, but with that, in, in December of 2017, I made just a regular trip um, to the U.S. Embassy in Moscow, uh, and and you know I was a senior officer at the time, um, you know in the senior intelligence service, so it wasn't operational. There's nothing sneaky. I'm too old and broken to be running SDRs, unfortunately. <laughs> um, uh, but but ultimately, I was there to to see our, uh, to, to meet the embassy personnel, to see our ambassador, who was John Huntsman, who was a you know, former governor of Utah, I yeah. believe, former ambassador of Beijing, really a great statesman, wonderful guy. Really is. And 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 also, I was well. That's right. That's right. You must know him from. from I've met him a couple of times, but yeah, I don't. It, yeah, it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful man. But but also to, I also was there to meet our counterparts in the Russian security services. Interestingly enough, even you know during the days, the worst days of the of the Cold War, CIA and KGB still had open lines of communication. That is actually critical. You know, you always want to maintain that. You know, U.S. military does with the Russian you know, general staff or, or whatever it is, but, you know, CIA does too with, uh, with what's now the, the SVR, the Russian, uh, you know, uh, 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 intelligence service. And so I was there to meet my counterparts. Um, and then what happened one night there, you know, after all the kind of the crap I've gone through all over the world, but what happened there kind of changed my life, forced me to retire. And, you know, I woke up in the middle of the night with, you know, uh, and staying in a five-star, you know, hotel, um, only a couple blocks from the U S embassy, but with, with an incredible headache with, with vertigo, um, stunning vertigo, uh, you know, tinnitus ringing in my ears, probably something that, you know, from your past that you, you know all about I have it right now. Um, yeah, that's right. Um, and, uh, 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 and, and something really happened to me and it started this kind of awful four year health journey, um, in, in which, you know, so something happened to me that night. Um, I came back, I, you know, I was, I, 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 I had incredible brain fog. I couldn't drive. I, 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 in essence, my career almost ended at that point while I kept my position. Um, for some time, I was only be able to work two or three hours a day. Um, and finally, I made it to to Walter Reed's uh, National Intrepid Center of Excellence called NICO. Mm -hmm. That's the U.S. military's leading um, traumatic brain injury center. I, I've been there with a lot of your former yeah. colleagues um, from the special operations community. And I was diagnosed with a traumatic brain injury from from something that happened to me. Um, I still have, you know, headache now. Uh, I've had it for four years. Um, uh, you know, the, the tinnitus comes and goes, mm -hmm. the vertigo comes and goes, but it's a it's been a you know pretty miserable kind of you know journey, um, uh, but but ultimately you know going you know, I I was in such a bad state when I I I got to Nike in January of 2021. It's a one month program. Um, you're there for 10 hours a day, but I was not in good shape there because you know ultimately this you know the idea of chronic pain, um, uh, uh, as you know I think you know from from your, from your background and from probably your your brothers um, is is pretty debilitating both both physically but also mentally. Mm -hmm. But, but, you know, Walter Reed kind of gave me hope and gave me some tools. So I'm doing much better. Right. Um, and then ultimately, you know, some of these things started happening to my colleagues. Mm -hmm. You know, it actually did happen in Havana, Cuba, where there was a, there was a whole bunch of U.S. Uh, embassy personnel who were, uh, who were affected like me. And then it started happening overseas to some others as well. And so there's a there's there is certainly a giant mystery in what's going on now. Um, you know, Russia has had a history of a directed energy weapons program. Um, you know, uh, you know, and and so I think there there is there they are a prime candidate as a you know an adversary who's doing this. Um, the CIA just came out with an interim report on this that I think was was rather flawed, and I wasn't too happy with it. But ultimately, 
you know, they're, they, they, there's still several dozen cases they can't explain. I think they've explained away some others, um, but they have to keep going. And, and this affects members of the U.S. military as well. I, you know, I, I remember sitting down, I, I, you know, uh, you know, Chris Miller, the former mm. acting secretary of defense um, and, you know, former special operations, uh, you know, I think he was in fifth group for a long time. Um, I met him in Iraq in 2002 and I, I had dinner with him after he, you know, uh, uh, after he, uh, uh, after he left government. Um, and he knows of individuals you know, from the DOD side and the soft community who this has happened to. And so, you know, it's real. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's not something I want to be remembered for at all. Mm-hmm. I don't like being a professional victim. Um, but I do feel a responsibility to kind of advocate on, on behalf of the victims. And I equate this to, you know, uh, what happened with Agent Orange or Gulf War Syndrome or burn pits. Is there, you know, there's something's happened to our personnel. It takes the U.S. government a long time to, to acknowledge it. You got to fight for people to get health care. Um, and that's kind of where I, that's where I am right now is, is, is really trying to push, push those who are, have been injured, um, uh, to, to receive the care that they, that, that they deserve. Because ultimately, you know, I made a pact with, with the central intelligence agency when I joined and I, they asked me to do some really weird shit over the years. That's the only way I could, but you always knew that you know, if you got jammed up, you know, they'd have your back and, and they didn't for me. Yeah. They do now. So the new CI director, Bill Burns is much better on this. He's a good man and, and he's providing health care to injured officers. Um, uh, but we got to keep going. And, uh, and, and it's, it's been a, it's been a really amazing kind of journey for me where, where I've, I've kind of, sorry, I'm going off on a tangent here, but I've gotten involved in this whole issue of, um, of, of healthcare for veterans, for Mm -hmm. example. I mean, I'm I'm on the board of a company, it's called sound off and it's a, it's an actual, an app that provides anonymous mental healthcare services for vets because 17 veterans kill themselves every day, which is an insane number Mm -hmm. that that's horrifying. Um, uh, it's formed by the, the brother-in-law of a former SEAL who, who tragically committed suicide, you know, Bill Mulder, who I knew, um, he was from Dev Group. Yeah, I don't know if you knew I Bill. Did. Uh, um, and Bill worked for me at, you know, during a rotation at, at, at agency headquarters. Um, but his brother-in-law started this, uh, uh, you know, and because, because, you know, even, uh, you know, there, there's a stigma in our world of getting care when you need it. Yeah. And, and we kind of have to break that. And if, and if an anonymous app, which can provide someone uh, an ability to talk to a mental health care provider um, is going to help and not and, and reduce that stigma because it's always out there, whether it's, you know, my world or your world, mm-hmm. you know, taking a knee is always hard, especially if you have any kind of brain injury. Um, uh, and so, uh, so ultimately this, it's, it's a, it's a company called sound off. So I really believe in that. So it's, it's opened up a whole new world for me. Um, that I, that I, I, I got to be really passionate about. Amazing. So people can go to like the app store and get it there, go to the website at soundoff.com yep. oh, or something. Sound off, yeah. Yeah, it's sound off. And so it's a, it's, it's, it's a, it's a company that they're already up and running in 50 States. Wow. Um, they're treating several hundred, you know, vets in, uh, uh, you know, anonymously again in Texas, they're expanding. Um, you know, there's, there's been some, some, you know, kind of great press on this, which is really important to kind of spread the word. Yeah. Um, the, you know, fa- like, you know, Naval, uh, uh, Naval Special Warfare Foundation, um, uh, uh, has, has signed on to this as well. Right. So, you know, the SEAL community is, is, um, uh, Navy SEAL Foundation, I'm sorry, NSF. Um, the SEAL community is, is, is involved in this and, uh, and others as well. So it's really important. Again, it's, it's getting people care who, who need it. And it just, it's, uh, it's something I feel passionate about because I've, I've gone through such, you know, such a struggle. Um, and I really understood kind of the stigma. And, and again, when I went through my treatment, I went through, you know, with, with kind of yeah. the, you know, members of your old tribe yeah. and, uh, and, and everyone kind of had that same kind of after, after you kind of get treatment, um, it's okay. You can be a tough badass. Um, but also say is like, Hey, something's wrong with me. Yeah. I need some help right now. Yeah. Um, especially after 20 years of doing this crazy job. Yeah. Oh man. Well, I'm so glad that you got to Nyko. They, they've helped so many of my friends. Um, yeah. and, uh, and a lot of people didn't know about it. Like it kind of, was like this kind of word right. of mouth thing. And if you knew somebody in the, the medical side of the military, they could direct you there and it was, but yeah, they've helped right. so many of my friends. So I'm glad you went there and, and, uh, that things are, things are, are, are looking, looking better. Cause what an, yeah. what an incredible thing to have done after the, especially near the end of all your time in oh, there to exactly. have some directed yeah. energy weapon thing. Whatever happened. Yeah. yeah. I mean, are you kidding? Like if it wasn't, you know, Al Qaeda, Taliban, Hamas, Hezbollah, you know, I get hit with this, yeah. but yeah, it's just, I guess my time was up. I don't know, but it's, it's one of those weird things. Yeah. Um, you know, five-star hotel and, 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 you know, and, and that, that's, that's what finally got me, but well, it is what it is. I think I'm going to have to have my, uh, my protagonist, Navy SEAL sniper, James Reese, put a bullet in somebody's yes. head that's using one of these weapons in a, uh, a future novel. And if you, if you, if you read that, you'll know that it's uh, that one's for you. I love um, it. Oh, crazy. 
Oh, man, well, man, thanks for taking all this time to to, to hang out for a little bit. It was such an honor to to get to spend a little little time with you. Um, and so, so what are you doing now? You have the book. Are you going to write another one? Uh, I see you on on TV all the time. Every time I walk, I see you on it. I'm like, oh, turn it up. You know, so I'm excited about what uh, you know your perspective no, on all I, these I'm, things. I'm excited for the next couple of months. Um, you know, one of the things with the book is and there was there's a couple of ways I could have gone with the book in terms of leadership, mm-hmm. and one is kind of the corporate route. And trust me, if some if, you know some companies will come and pay me to do a, a corporate speech, and that's great because the the pay is good, so I'll, I'll do that. But what I what I've actually really gotten into is is doing these speeches on leadership for sports teams, for athletic teams. And so uh, my son plays college baseball, and so so I so I'm in that whole college baseball world. So I was just off talking to a coach of a of a St. John's University just now nice. in Queens, New York, you know, Division One school, and he said, "Come on up and talk to the boys." And so. I'm gonna, the, the consulting I'm going to do on leadership is really going to be focused on athletics nice. um, and, and particularly baseball teams. But one of the things, and I, and I love doing this, um, is, is it's a combination of the leadership principles, but it's also talking to them about public service. Mm. And, and, you know, there is still a silly aura about CIA and that's great, but I'll use that to my advantage in the sense of listen to my stories, but you know what, if you want to join the military, the intelligence community, FBI, DA, D, you know, DEA, you know, that is that is a route that I still want people to take. And, and you want the younger generation to still be proud of this country and proud to do public service. And uh, and so I, I sneak that message in there. Nice. And, you know, if you go talk to 20, you know, 20 college baseball players and one or two of them afterwards are like, I think I want to do something like that. And that's awesome. You know, not only will the leadership stuff help with their team, but I want to get them kind of pumped about national security and get involved in, in public service because I'm enormously proud of of, you know, of what we all did. Um, and, uh, and I, you know, you want to pass the torch to the next generation. I think it's a nice way to do it. Yeah, no, absolutely. I noticed all the, the sports references, uh, in here. So I know you're a, you're a sports guy. Um, that is awesome. And then where, where can people find you on the, the social channel? You're on Twitter and Instagram and all that stuff. Your website's yep. great, by the way. So, uh, where can people find you? Right, so the, the, the website's markpalmonopolis.com. There's a, it's, there's actually, we're going to expand it a little bit in the next couple of weeks. There's, there's going to be some more pages on that. Um, I'm on Twitter. It's at M polymer and it's, you know, forgive me if anyone jumps on there. So I'll talk about baseball or like the best dive bar in the area. Um, I'm all over the place on everything. I'll, I'll talk politics sometimes and zing every side. So everyone's always mad at me. Um, so it's great. Uh, but it's, it's it, so, you know, when I wrote the book and the HarperCollins has been a wonderful publisher, but they were like, oh God, your Twitter account. You know? <laughs> and, and, but I didn't change. Yeah. You know, you got to be authentic. There you and, go. And it's, uh, I'm, I'm tweeting about football last night and I got pissed about something here and there. And then I'll talk about, you know, there's a great local dive bar here called the Vienna. Inn. So next <laughs> I noticed that in here also. So I was like, man, we got to meet up there for a drink. That'd be amazing. Absolutely. I'm, I'm all over the place and inconsistent and it's, it's awesome. So it's, it's at M polymer and, and good luck. And I'm sure some of the readers will love it. Some of them will be angry and that's okay. Cause the other thing too, is I also, one thing I do do is I engage on social media with people all the mm-hmm. time. And, and, you know, some of my great friends from the agency, particularly, you know, from our, from, you know, our special activity center from ground branch, um, get pissed at me. You know, they're right now they're, some of them are mad because I, they think I'm advocating war with Ukraine. And so I, I had a big debate with one of them last night, but it's, um, it's not, I'm not advocating for that. And it's a, I love, I love just chatting with, with folks all the time. And, you know, you, as you know, it's, you know, you end up having, a, you know, you know, going places and people come up to you and, and you actually do have an, an effect on their lives sometimes. And, um, it's pretty humbling. Um, I, I still can't believe someone, I mean, maybe you had this when you wrote your first book, like someone actually wrote, read my book. Yeah. They bought I read your book. I bought it. I know. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm humbled by that. It's totally humbling to uh, me. So yeah, it's been fun. Oh man. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for doing Thank you for writing this. Thank you for sharing the story. Thank you for everything you. that you're doing to raise awareness about these, uh, you know, these brain injuries and everything, all that, those sort of things that, that happened to you right there and going to NICO and, and, uh, I appreciate you stepping out and, uh, and spending this time with me. And then also for jumping on both social channels and on the, on the news to give your perspective, because it's Perfect. so valuable with that foundation and, uh, for th- everything that you've given this country. So thank you, uh, for that as well. Thanks, Jack. It was awesome. Thank you so much awesome. for today. Awesome. You take care. Let's meet up for that drink soon. Yes. All right. Take care. Make 2022 the year that you take control of your finances. Right here, this is my original Navy Federal Credit Union card. Look at that right there. I've been a member since 1996. So go to NavyFederal.org. Check out everything that they have going on over there and make 2022 the year that you take control of your finances. All right. Mountain Tough. MTN Tough. Awesome. There's a huge announcement from the crew over at Mountain Tough. MTN Tough. After two years in the making, behind the scenes, the Mountain Tough 
Plus, Native App is finally here for you and ready to be downloaded on all the platforms. iPhone, Android, Apple TV, Roku, and more. MTN Tough Plus is the fitness app trusted by the dedicated, trusted and used by dedicated backcountry hunters, wildlife firefighters, law enforcement officers, and U.S. military special operations forces. And now you can train on your time, your way from your phone, tablet, TV, or web. MTN Tough Plus. Plus is an all access subscription, giving you access to all Mountain Tough programs, all new programs and bonus content. Awesome. If you've been following me for a while, you know that I have prioritized finishing my latest novel and moving. This will probably be one of the last things I do from this studio as we move to the new house and new studio. Um, So that is about to change my priorities moving forward. Well, I'm going to get better at scheduling these things and actually getting those workouts in, then working for about three or four hours on the novel, then jumping into the business side of thing for an hour or two. But uh, point being, MTN Tough, Mountain Tough is the program that I am using. Uh, I've been scouring the website, checking out the app. It is absolutely awesome. And these days with so much going on, I need something that's going to tell me what to do uh, because I'm going to shift right from doing one thing bam, into the workout and having it right there, ready to rock. That's exactly what I need. So thank you guys for putting this together and putting so much thought, time, energy, effort, and testing into it. Um, Because what I want to do these days uh, is be ready for life. Uh, And yeah, I'm probably not jumping out of a plane anymore and uh, and going doing those special operations type missions. Um, Now it is training for life and to keep up with very active kids. Um, but this is what I'm going to use MTN mountain tough, increase mental toughness, build muscle, improve endurance anytime, anywhere from any mobile device. Thousands of workouts are available in the MTN tough plus subscription. You can start today with no equipment needed to start. That's what also that I liked what I saw. You can have equipment or no equipment. Um, and there are workouts for every level, beginner, intermediate, advanced, elite. Um, just get on there and check it out. And then more importantly, get after it. Uh, everything you need is in one spot. From cardio to strength, Mountain Tough programs are designed to be built around the build the optimal athlete. Thousands of hours of testing on dedicated mountain hunters, first responders, and military personnel programs for everyone, those who hit the gym and the heavyweights, and those who like to work out at home with no gear at all. Stream from your TV, laptop, mobile, or tablet. Download workouts in iOS and Android compatible with Chromecast and AirPlay. MTN Tough has been the trusted training for dedicated individuals for years now, including U.S. military special operations and dedicated backcountry hunters. There is no excuse for you not to start today, as after two years of research and development, the MTN Tough Plus native app is ready to download. With MTN Tough Plus, you can conquer your goals with thousands of workouts and train with equipment or just your body weight on your phone, tablet, TV, or web browser. MTN Tough is offering Danger Close listeners 20% off all new Mountain Tough Plus subscriptions with the code Danger Close. Go to mtntough.com and enter the code Danger Close to receive 20% off brand new Mountain Tough Plus subscription. That again is mtntough.com and enter the code Danger Close. Welcome to the gear highlight portion of the Danger Close podcast. All right, a couple things to go over. I'm going to start with jackcarusa.com, which is where you can find the merch, hats, bookmarks, shirts, all that sort of thing, and Yeti mugs and these things. How awesome is that? That is serious on this side. Never tell me the odds. Strength and honor. Cross Tom Hawks, little American flag over here. So if you're interested in that sort of thing, and I love these. I use this size uh, cup all the time and uh, awesome. So Yeti, thank you. Awesome. Jackcarusa.com to check that stuff out. What else do I have here? GLG Knife Works. I know I've talked about these guys before. They come in all different colors. And what is this? This is something you might need to take into a non-permissive environment as a bookmark, but you also don't want to get stabbed in the throat or the eye or the temple or anywhere else with this thing, but GLG Knife Works, check them out. Awesome. 
Love these things. All right. Elmer Rush right here. I think he's on Facebook, but look at that tomahawk. Ah, this thing is awesome. I mean, this thing is legit. I have quite a few tomahawks. Uh, if you followed me for a while, you know, and you know that my protagonist, Navy SEAL sniper James Reese, is quite fond of using tomahawks as well. But uh, look at that thing. That thing just looks mean. So, uh, Elmer, thank you so much. This is awesome. Dustin, who made this happen, thank you so much. Incredible. Love it. And just got back from Safari Club International Convention, where I gave a little talk on Saturday, which was great. Um, got to meet up with a bunch of old friends back there. And uh, it's always a reunion. Absolutely love going to Safari Club International. So check them out. And while I was there, I got to link up with Jim from African Sporting Creations. And if you've been following me for a while and you followed my trip to Africa a couple of years ago where I went to research some, um, uh, or help actually uh, do some research in Mozambique, but then about a year later, went back, did some research in South Africa uh, for helping train up an anti-poaching unit. They were switching over to Glocks and M4s um, from what they had been using, protecting some of the last rhino on earth out there. Um, but I did some posts around that, and some of that gear I took was from African Sporting Creations. So um, this right here is a gift from Jim. Uh, very cool. And what goes in here? My Black Raffle Coffee. This is a coffee press. I'd actually had my eye on this thing for a number of years. Um, and then Jim sent it. So thoughtful. Knows that I like coffee. And uh, this thing right here is just super cool. So check out African Sporting Creations uh, because they have awesome stuff. But And also because Jim is such an awesome guy. Um, if you went to my website, or not my website, if you went to my Instagram page in um, back in November, you will have seen a repost from Rescue 22 Foundation. And Rescue 22 Foundation was set up to help train service dogs for those suffering the um, mental, emotional, physical trauma of the battlefield. So um, incredible organization. But I found out about uh, United States Marine, Kelsey Lanehart through them. And she was at uh, Abbey Gate at... Uh, Hamad Garza International Airport on 26 August, 2021. Uh, and she was wounded in that bombing that killed 170 Afghans and 13 members of the United States Armed Forces. Um, so she was there, she was paralyzed, lost the use of her leg. If you scroll down on my Instagram, this is what the post looks like right there. There she is with her service dog. And um, you can help support her, help support Rescue 22. If you scroll down to that post, you can check that out and you can go to Rescue 22 website and uh, find out how to support more from there as well. But um, but Jim at African Sporting Creations saw that post and he reached out to me and uh, asked how he could help. And he is paying for one full year of dog food for that dog that Rescue 22, my friend John Devine, is training up for Kelsey. So, uh, Jim, thank you so much. Uh, once again, that's, uh, one of the positive sides of social media. A lot of times we concentrate on the negative aspects of social media, but that, uh, that was a, a positive. So, uh, Kelsey, man, so inspired by you, uh, keep fighting out there. And Jim, thank you for doing that. And, uh, everybody else. Yeah. I'll see you next time. Thank you for tuning into the danger close podcast. An Ironclad original presented by Navy Federal Credit Union. You can find out more about Mark at his website, which is findingclarityintheshadows.com. Or you can just type in his name, which is Mark, M-A-R-C, Polymeropolis, and I'll spell it for you. P-O-L-Y-M-E-R-O-P-O-U-L-O-S. Pop that in. The website comes up. You can find out more about him, more about his book, Clarity in Crisis, which you can get wherever books are sold. And that website of his will also point you in the direction of his social channels as well, which we discussed there at the end of the podcast. You can find me at officialjackcar.com and you can find me on the social channels at Jack Carr USA. And you can find the merch at jackcarusa.com. You can pre-order my next book, which we also discussed on this podcast, In the Blood, which is coming in hot 31 May 20. 22. Until the next time, take care out there, stay safe, keep fighting.